in Chicago, the White Sox fans waving the white hankies, anything white. Not only haven't they won a uh, World Series since 1917, they haven't won a home postseason game since game one of the 1959 World Series. That would be early win who beat the Dodgers, but that would be a long time ago. And these White Sox fans saw that Boston did it last year. Hey, their curse is gone. What about our curse? But Red Sox fans travel well. Plenty of Boston fans here in Chicago, although they certainly are outnumbered. There it is. Which Sox will it be? The White Sox of 99 wins. The Red Sox of 95 wins. The first time a Red Sox team has won 95 or more three straight years ever. And the first time that they've won 90 plus or more four straight years since 1914, 1917. Boomer, I don't think it's possible to give Ozzie Guillen enough credit for everything that he did. As they were coming down the stretch, they started to fade. People were getting all over them. They are the best team with the best record in the American League this year during the regular season. And if there's ever energy out of a manager's spot, he will define it, as you'll see this afternoon. And we welcome those of you that have just watched the Cardinals and the Padres kick things off here. Padres, well, they gave people a cause to think in St. Louis. And now who will be thinking harder here? The Red Sox or White Sox? And guys, let's point out right away here a 310 local start. How the shadows, Mike, you catch. Rick, you pitch. How will this affect everybody involved? Well, I'll tell you right now, it, it, it's a real good time to pitch, huh, Michael? <laughs> uh, no question about it. In 1996, we opened up against the Atlanta Braves at Dodger Stadium at 5 o'clock against John Smoltz. So needless to say, uh, we didn't have much of a chance. <laughs> the Red Sox line up. Johnny Damon. Of course, leads it off, and you saw him run again the last week of the season. Edgar Renteria is the shortstop. David Ortiz, big poppy. What hasn't he done? Leading the majors with 148 RBIs. Right behind, in homers and ribbies, Manny Ramirez and left. Trot Nixon, playing against righties, lefties, all of them in right field. Jason Baratek, the captain, who wears that C so proudly behind the plate. Kevin Millar gets the start. He has hit Contreras well, despite the fact... That you might have thought Olerud would get in there. Billy Miller, the batting champ of a couple of years ago, hitting eighth. Tony Graffanino at second base, midseason acquisition going up against Jose Contreras. 15 and 7, who's been nothing short of brilliant in the second half. Well, Boomer, you talked about which Sox team will show up. We got to wonder which Jose Contreras will show up. The guy that was perfect in the month of September, he was the American League Pitcher of the Month, or the guy that has struggled in his career against these Boston Red Sox. Well, let's look at the defense and the White Sox. Certainly, this is one area where, on paper, they have an advantage over the Red Sox. Yeah, no question about it. I mean, if you're going to give the Red Sox more than three outs an inning, you're really going to be in trouble. So these guys can catch the ball. They're playing good defense and, you know, make the routine plays. You make the spectacular play once in a while. But if you're going to allow these guys to continue to get more outs than they should, they're going to really hurt you. So we're underway with Jose Contreras, a perfect 6-0 in September. You look at a lot of his numbers, and there's the numbers of Johnny Damon, 316. And he flirted with the chance to win the batting title for a while. But I think at 316, he's, uh, he didn't have to say excuse me to anybody. Now Rick and I talked to him before the game. He said he feels great. And there's a glove right away by Paul Canerco. Hit well by Damon. Canerco is there to snare the first out of the game. Mike, that's such a great point about how important it is for Chicago to make all of the plays and then occasionally come up with a great play like that from Canerco. They have to be on their toes defensively. That, to me, was really the big key to their success. They've got a lot of starting pitchers that, that are okay. I mean, they, they've won some games in the past, but they became great because these guys made a lot of plays. Edgar Renneria swinging as hot about as he's had for Boston the last couple of weeks. But the come over from St. Louis, not as smooth as everybody thought. Look, we've known about Renneria since he arrived as, what, a 19-year-old and 
won games for Florida. World Series, a Division Series game against the Giants. He's been a big-time player for a long time, but he, he scuffled in Boston for him. Agree? He really did, Boomer. And, Mike, you know a lot about this. I mean, to me, he had a lot of the same pressure this year that Alex Rodriguez did a year ago with the Yankees. And changing leagues. It's tough for anybody. But he's one of those cut and slash type hitters that in a playoff situation you can't underestimate it because he's the guy that in the clutch it's tough to jam him he has that inside out swing takes a lot of pitches as you see here 2-1 pitch and that's fisted Canerco kind of lost it for a minute and look at that just like you say Mike and Renneria is going to try for two safe they had a chance but Uribe couldn't handle the throw from Dye, so there's an excuse me double to look like a shot off the wall in the scoreboard. That's what I'm just saying. It's just so tough to jam him. Because he, he throws that knob across his body right here. Inside, you see, he keeps the bat close to his body. And that looks like a line drive. And you know, Mike, <laughs> there's a lot of guys here for the Red Sox that have postseason experience. There's a lot for the White Sox without it. And that clearly was a play that Uribe could have made. He could have applied the tag. That could have been a big out there. Instead, runner in scoring position, and here comes the big two. Can't underestimate the adrenaline factor, I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> David Ortiz. No full-time designated hitter has ever been named the MVP. He could be the first. It'll be a tight boat with him and A-Rod. Inside the big pappy, and each team plays him differently. Of course, with the runner at second base, you're limited so a little bit, but still the softball-type short center fielder alignment with a Gucci way out on the grass, guys. Shortstop for Rebate directly behind the pitcher. You see a lot of these exaggerated shifts in the last few years, just from the intense scouting reports and the charts. I mean, you have every last thousand balls he's put in play, so <laughs> it gives you a little bit of an indication of where he's going to end up swinging. Do you like him when your team doesn't? I'm sorry? Do you like him when you guys say, hey, move four guys over there? And I'm a little bit of a traditionalist. I believe the guys have been there for 100 years, so why are you going to move them so much? <laughs> 2-0 count to David Ortiz taking the strike. Part of the strategy, right, is even though they respect Contreras and what he's done, maybe build up the pitch count and see what the... Uh, it's been their strategy him. the last three years. Their outstanding hitting coach, Ron Jackson, he said, very seldom do you win a game with a solo home run. Very seldom do you lose one when you hit a three-run homer. That's their game plan. Inside Ortiz, and that'll be three and one to him. Yeah, these guys take a lot of pitches, a lot of pitches, and they're not afraid to hit with two strikes. I mean, that's one of the keys to good hitting. You, you were know. talking with Ron Jackson yeah. about that before the game, yeah. No question. Has he done a good job? Of course, it helps to have Ortiz and Ramirez, but he's one of the best. Papa Jack. Those are very coachable guys. <laughs> oh, there is that one that dipped right down, and that's and Seth will have you explain it here. It's not so much the splitter, it's an old-fashioned fork ball. Well, he can really get, he uses a softball to get his fingers loose as he goes around it. But Boomer, also, what he has added, he's added a straight changeup. He's throwing more two-seam fastballs now than he has in the past. And he's got a slider, not just a fastball fork ball guy. Full count to Big Pappy here in the first. Wow, had him fishing. And a big strikeout for Contreras, two out. He figured with the base open here, he's going to go ahead and try to expand the strike zone. Right here, 3-2 split, just dropped off the table. Hard to hit, hard to catch. And still, as we mentioned to begin with, hard to see. David Ortiz not normally fooled like that. Now two down with a runner at second base. And... Out of the frying pan and into the fire. There's Ortiz, and now here's Manny Ramirez. 144 RBIs on the season. Mike, you did the same kind of thing, but the consistent production from Manny Ramirez, I mean, to me, just remarkable. He is. He's like a clock. I mean, he goes out there every day, prepares for the game. We saw him watching video before the game in the clubhouse. Yeah. And knows what he wants to do, knows the pitch he wants to hit. Chopper to third. Joe Treaty. 
Ooh, he short armed it to Tenerco, who dug it out. Renneria is stranded. Contreras gets out of it. The White Sox coming to bat in the first. Chicago, the White Sox coming to the plate. And manager Ozzie Guillen's starting lineup begins with the man with 59 stolen bases, second in the league, Scott Pitsednik adventure, the left fielder. Tadahito Aguchi, a longtime pro in Japan, excellent first year in the bigs over here at second. Jermaine Dye, first healthy year in about three years. You see it, what it meant with 31 homers. Not only Ortiz, not only Ramirez, but Paul Canerco has 40 homers two years in a row. Carl Everett, one-time Red Sox, is the designated hitter. Aaron Rowan is the center fielder. He can hit the homers, although that production down this year. A.J. Brzezinski in the postseason again, behind the play with 18 homers. Joe Creedy, 22 homers at third base. And the dangerous and underrated Juan Uribe hitting ninth at the shortstop against the all-star pitcher for the Boston Red Sox. Almost became a White Sox in this offseason. One-time pitched across town for the Chicago Cubs, Matt Clement. 32 starts this year for Clement. He won 22 of them, the Boston Red Sox, when he was on the mound. They've got a lot of confidence in him, and he said before the game he has a lot of confidence in what's going to happen for him today. Cheating it on the grass is Miller at third. Cognizant of the wheels of Pitsednik. The White Sox are interesting. Yes, they scored 160 less runs than Boston. 169, of course, they gave up 160 less. So you can see the difference in the teams, but how each got there. But they can play small ball or big ball, can't they? Yeah, Scott Pesednik is their table setter. I mean, he gets on base. He breaks up the entire rhythm of the game. Pitcher has always got to be conscious of where he is. He knows he could steal that base. And when he gets on base, Boomer, I don't think there's anybody in baseball, as he does now, that has seen more fastballs this year than Aguchi because of the speed of Potsednik. Well, they hit the by pitch, and so do you anticipate the White Sox. Once upon a time, that last home World Series game that they won, they were the go-go White Sox. Will we see go-go from Potsednik? <laughs> you know what? He, that was their key all year long, right? I think he has to, and like you said, with uh, Taguchi behind him, he's getting a lot of heaters, able to... Let him steal the base, take a pitch. Clement is pretty good, pretty quick going to home plate. We know veritex has got a strong arm. He does not have a great pickoff move, so I look for Putsednik to get out there as far as he can. Tadahito Oguchi in time is called. John Hirschbeck is the uh, home plate umpire, the crew chief. You'll see Clement here. I mean, he just wants to break up Pesednik's rhythm. I mean, he doesn't want to get him a running start. He's going to utilize the hold, step off. So Clement and Aguchi lays down a butt. Veritex going to have to go to first with it. And very good. Strategic small ball play by the White Sox. Yeah, they're breaking that out right away. Get the runner in scoring position. You know, it tells me, too, that, that they've lost a little bit of confidence in Potsednik in the stolen base. Uh, you know, several of them this year down from last year, but he had a leg injury right about the All-Star break. He got thrown out a lot, and I think Isaac Gian said, you know what, we've got a lot of momentum going right now with our team, with this crowd. Let's just go ahead and put him in a scoring position and let the big boys come up and hit. And that big boys would be Jermaine Dye and Paul Konerko. Dye with 31 homers, 86 RBIs this year. Oh, you're right, Rick. I mean, and then, you know, give him a pitch or two to steal the base and possibly bunt him to third with less than two outs. And then again, the step out. But Sednik, you know, uh, 17 of 18 times successful when he goes for third. We'll see. In there for a strike. Now, Sutton, Mike, talk about the Clement that we're going to see here. The ball's weaving, bobbing. It'd be interesting to catch, wouldn't it? Well, to be a complimentary, uh, it's effectively wild, as we say. <laughs> as a catcher, it's not a lot of fun. 
Always one of the league leaders and hit batsmen. He's going to yeah. walk some people. And Mike, they got to go up there and try to hit off of him yeah. in the twilight. I, and as a catcher, he's going to set up outside. He's going to throw inside. Inside, he's going to throw outside. Right there. His Veritek tried to go away and sunk the ball back over the plate. So he's got to be on his toes. How about your success off of Matt Clement? Uh, well, <laughs> I have no success. He actually threw de a fall, fell down one time and threw a strike in, in, in Florida. <laughs> he gives me fits. So. He's got the ability to dominate, and uh, a lot of times he will just get himself in trouble, as he has here with the, you know, the hit by pitch yeah. with Pudsednik. But uh, he's got great stuff, no question. And he's a guy that will always take the ball. And t that's important. I mean, you got stuff, you have uh, poise on the mound, and you have command. And two out of three, those are the ones you want. Die hammers that foul. Just in case you were wondering, Mike, we come with everything here. Let's see. Mike Piazza against Matt Clement. Four for 24, 8K. <laughs> Sorry. You don't have to tell me that. Sorry. <laughs> I got it right here. <laughs> hey, Boomer, do me a favor. Let's let's don't go with his career numbers against me, all right? Let's, <laughs> let's just... Both Dodger Rookie of the Years. Yeah. I thought you guys had a code here, you know? It's a fraternity. I thought we were tight, too. But... Uh, he got on my tie. I'm getting on his coat. <laughs> nice tie. I like that tie. That's what you wore in behind the chest protector all these years. Exactly. Now <laughs> yeah, the Red Sox had a runner at second base and didn't play him in the first. Can the White Sox? One and two to die. Ooh, and there's another hit by pitch. Wow. How about building a rally? Two hit by pitch and a sacrifice. Mike, just like you talked about as we take a look at the replay, you can see Veritek sitting on the outer half. He moves out, and look where it ends up. 16 times he uh, hit batters this year, second most in the league. Yeah. His stuff is erratic stuff, and to be effective, he has to have some sort of command as to what side of the plate. I mean, you split the plate in thirds, and uh, that, that's going to make a day tough for him. Especially to this lineup because they are a very underestimated lineup. Only two men have hit back to back seasons of 40 or more home runs for the White Sox. The man that threw out the first pitch today, the injured Frank Thomas, and the man at the plate, Paul Konerko. 40 this year. There goes Pitsedny. Baratek with the throw. Safe. Sednick probably had a few pitches to read him. Picked up his tendencies a little bit. And really tough for Veritek here, too, when you got a big cleanup hitter on the third base side of that box, isn't it? Yeah, it wasn't a bad throw, just a little high, but he got a great jump. I mean, I think Clement did not look at him a second time, and he took off. He could put, pick him up and put him down. I'll tell you that much. He, he definitely can run. You still have the double play in order here. Runners at the corners now for Konerko on 0-1. Yeah, I'm looking out there. That shadow was probably got about another half inning. This may be it for at least ball in sun leaving pitcher's hand and ball in shadow at plate. That is tough and tough to see. And then on top of that with Clements, effectively wildness. Haven't been that effectively wild thus <laughs> far. <laughs> Ineffectively. Yes. Yeah. Born to be wild. Yeah. Two and one. Now, Canerco here just wants to keep the ball off the ground. That's basically. one thing that, Mike, the White Sox have been so good at all year long. They, they do not hit into a lot of ground ball double plays what's the key to that you look for something up look for something do you go the opposite field? yeah I'm always trying to look opposite field here trying to recognize the pitch not anticipate a certain pitch let the ball travel not try to pull the ball the ball is traveling down the left field line just foul A 2-1 count, and he was ready for it. 2-1 count. Paul just sat back and just a little quick. 
Here's the bench. Get out, get out, stay fair. See, nobody waved it like watch, fist. That they have to watch fist the hitter. Him. Watch the hitter, yep. not He'll the ball. Know. Carlton Fist such a standout for these two teams. Hall of Famer. Two balls, two strikes. Runners at the corners here in the bottom of the first. Chomp, fair ball. Miller goes to second to Graffinino to get one out. But Pitsednik scores and the White Sox are on the board. Working with us today, uh, down on the field and in the stands, is Aaron Andrews. Aaron? Well, Boomer, you can really tell these Chicago White Sox are underdogs, can't you? Well, that's what they're playing with, the no-respect mentality. Ozzie Guillen says we are underdogs. He said we've been in first place for much of this whole thing, but you haven't even noticed because when you are the White Sox, you have to accomplish something or you're not going to be in the spotlight. Scott Pesednik being... Scott Pesednik echo echoing that comment, saying, hey, we've been playing with a chip on our shoulder all season long. Why change now? Carl Everett. Thank you, Aaron. Carl Everett. And Ozzy would know we played so well for the White Sox for 13 years. Matter of fact, was on a, one of those teams that got to the postseason in 1993. It seems like their attitude is the same as Boston last year. They really feel like they do have something to prove. I think that comes too with confidence, don't you? Yes. I mean, they, they won 99 games this year. They I mean, they, they dominated their division, and when things started to get away from them, they had to pick it up, and, and Ozzie Gann's team was able to do that. Played very well the last week of the season. Everett rips this to right. Nixon will let it bounce in front of him. And Canerco stops at second base, so Everett hammering that one. With everything going on on the base pass, it's hard to remember. That's the first hit of the game for the White Sox. And watch Carl Everett here all over the dish. And Carl just crowds the dish and dares you to come in there. Quick bat. That was a little bit away, and he actually raked the ball to right field, pulled that ball. You talked earlier about the adrenaline, and, 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 and you know players have the ability to slow it down. Some don't. To me right now, the problem for Matt Clement, he's, just, he's, he, he's overthrowing. He's only got a good sinking fastball. He's not thrown one yet that has had any tilt to it. That's the reason the balls are being hit in the air. Two out, two on, and the number six hitter for the White Sox, the center fielder Aaron Rowan. Pride of Cal State Fullerton up. Rowan can hit long ball, although this year had 13 to this 24 that he had the year before. That misses. You, know, you can't forget the play that Billy Miller made there on mm -hmm. the ground ball that was hit by Canerco. If he takes the easy route and goes to first, that base hit by Carl Everett would have been another run for the White Sox. Now I think this would be a huge break for Boston if Clement can get out of this with just one run. Another one of the best fielding Red Sox without a question. Gets overlooked all the time for his defense. Solid citizen. Great guy to have on your team. 150 games this year, Boomer, and only 11 errors for Billy Miller. And that's a difficult infield that he has in Boston to deal with. Another thought on Miller. I just have a hunch he's going to have a big series. You know why? Because he's at third, and the first base umpire and the umpire crew is Bill Miller. I just, I just think there's some karma there. There's some analysis for you, all right? Well, we're going to do a little... Analysis right here with pitching coach Dave Wallace coming to the mound and he's taking as much time as he possibly can because what he wants to do is for Matt Clement to slow things down right now. What does Veritech talk to Clement about now Mike? Well Johnny Roseborough my first catcher coach told me when you're in this situation you just want to go out he said let the breeze blow a little bit try to settle him down calm him down. And, you know, change his mechanics. He's obviously reaching for the ball. He's not letting him sell his, his ability. He's not letting his body deliver the pitch. He's trying to force the pitch. Same thing with hitting. They're very similar. You have to sit back and trust your ability. If you could just keep that same tension on the baseball yes. or on the bat, you, you give yourself a chance. Mm -hmm. 
swung through that one ahead of it. So Clement there with the strike, two and one. And if I were him right now, Boomer, I'd just give up on that fastball. I mean, he's not able to command it. He's hit a couple of guys. His slider is as good as, as there is in the big leagues. He, he he got one near the strike zone there. I, I think you just got to stick with that pitch. And if you're Aaron Rowan, I mean, you got to know that as well. Right there, as you said, with the fastball. Just cannot locate that pitch. And the slider's got a, a definite better feel for that pitch right now. When he's ahead, can add on it. When he's behind, he can subtract a little bit. And you can see uh, the start that Clement had, and it's one of the reasons he was an all-star pitcher. Since the middle of the season, not the same success. And Rowan won at ball four, but instead, we have a full count with two on and two out, and that means the Whirly Bird start. There's going to be a consistent strike zone with John Hirschbeck, but it's going to be bigger than most, is it not, Mike? Oh, no question about it. I mean, he, he wants you to swing the bat. That was a strike. I mean, it wasn't the prettiest strike, but uh, as you said, Veritek was away. Ball traveled back to the inside corner. It did get a lot of the plate. Big situation here early in the game, very early. I think he's got a full slider here, Boomer. I mean, that's, that's been the only pitch that he's really had success with and been able to get anywhere near what he wanted. Everybody moving. Ball flared in the left center field. Canerco will score. Everett to third. Rowan delivers. 2 nothing. Pale holds. the pitch here Rick slider down did not try to do too much with it just put the bat on the ball you nice piece of contact Mike that it was down another thing was down was his arm angle and when he drops down it's almost like you're telling the hitter it's not going to be a fastball yes. that was a nice piece of hitting there he stayed back great two strike hitting great two strike hitting right there now AJ Przinski in the postseason, a couple of times with the Minnesota Twins. Now has a chance with the White Sox. Once a foul. Zinski last year with the Giants, uh, so they were playing pressure ball, but they didn't get in. So he's he's one of these White Sox that, that gets what this atmosphere is. I think, I think, huh? That's I think Ian Boomer giving him a lot of credit, too, for the job that he has done handling the pitching staff. He reminds Contreras to work faster. He talks to, to John Garland about pitching in. He talks to Freddie Garcia about using all of his pitches. And you know what? They, they, they have performed. It's this one to left center field. Back it goes. Back, back. Gone! First inning here for the White Sox, a five spot against Matt Clement in Boston. You wouldn't know that Chicago hit more homers than Boston. Just one more. That was a big home run by Persitsky. Boomer, they come in on a roll. They won their last five regular season games. They swept the Cleveland Indians in Cleveland, and they keep that momentum going here in game one. Beautiful swing right here. As I said, didn't try to pull the ball. Inside out. Put some nice leverage on that pitch. Throw it out the other way. We're talking about his catching. He could still hit pretty well. You know what? So much for the shadows bothering the White Sox. <laughs> no. Wow. Joe Creedy, the eighth man to the plate here, has looked at two balls from Clement. So Przinski, who had 18 homers during the season, Boy, that was a tattoo. About 385 the opposite way. How about that? You hit a big home run, you got to slap the tools back on and get back <laughs> out there and catch. <laughs> Never happened to you. <laughs> no, only, no. Only 397 times. I want to stand around and look for the red red uh, light on the camera and <laughs> kind of smile. <laughs> 
Got to go back to work. The men up high, three and one. Well, we showed you the numbers. The last five starts for Matt Clement. 0 and 3 with an ERA of 7.20. And now you, you tack this on. And really, it began with two hit by pitches. Veritek sheds the mask. Boy, that's up there for a long time. 3D pops out. But what a first inning for the Chicago White Sox. 5 nothing after one. Five run first for the Chicago White Sox on this summer type day. Temperatures mid 80s, humid. And A.J. Pruszynski hit a long opposite field home run. White Sox scoring four of their five runs with two outs. And this crowd electric as Trot Nixon, Jason Veritek, and Kevin Millar try to chip away. And Jose Contreras, we told you Clement has had the trouble in the second half of the season. Not the case for Contreras. Every number you want to look at shows that he's just been almost automatic, hence the game one start. But here come the Red Sox. Scored the most runs in baseball, over 900 once again. We don't think they're going to say, okay, five runs, we're out of here. Not quite. Nixon begins with a base hit. You know, Boob, I just don't think you can give Scott Plitsednik enough credit for what happened in that first inning. Mike, he, he got on after the first couple of pitches. Now Matt Clement had to go to the stretch. He held the ball and held the ball, trying to, you know, interrupt the, the timing and the jump of Plitsednik. And the next thing you know, he just never could find command of that fastball. Yeah, we were saying uh, before, I think you really need to just kind of throw that run away and try to find, especially this early in the game, find that rhythm, find that release point that you're looking for. Um, and, you know, concede a run early, especially especially with these two teams. So here's the captain, Jason Veritek. In there for a strike is Contreras. Again, his last loss, August 15th. What's your philosophy, Rick, when you have a five-run lead, top of the set, uh, second inning? Now? You still have to use all of your pitches. It, to me, it doesn't change that pitch selection at all. It's just that you work on the plate rather than trying to work to a corner or off of it. And I think there's two types of teams. There's a team that's going to try to swing their way back into the game, and a team is going to try and walk their way back into the game, get base runners. Contreras quickly ahead of Veritek, 0-2. And I think Boston's a little of both. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's not as easy as people think. You have a five-run lead. It's top of the second. You know, we've talked about Boston's offense all year long. The third year in a row, they've led the majors in runs scored. But the Chicago White Sox this year, Boomer, actually hit more home runs than they I know. did. Three more home runs. Not near as many runs scored, but, of course, like you said, Mike, Boston had a lot more base on ball. Both the White Sox in there. Veritek didn't like that. And of course, he'll be... It, it's tough when you're a catcher and you're batting, right, Mike? And you yeah. want to go back and say something to the ump, but then you need him the next half in it. Yeah, absolutely. This looks like, looked like the, a high fork ball. Almost like a knuckleball type of pitch. He really, as we said earlier, he jams that ball in his hands, gets a knuckleball type action. It's not a true split-fingered fastball. It's more of a, a fork ball, which I believe Suter threw or pioneered yep. that pitch. And Ozzie Guillen talking before the game. He thinks the real key is the fact that Contreras, when he was with the Yankees, when he struggled against Boston, he was tipping his pitches. That goes on a lot more than you think. Oh, yeah. Especially when you got, when you know a guy has a nasty pitch. If you know it's coming, then you can eliminate that. Or if it's down right away, you could just spin on it, and then it plays mentally on the pitcher because he's like, wow, I threw a two-strike nasty split in the dirt, and the guy just looked at it. What's yeah. going on? So you get that sort of... You know something's up. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> How did he not offer? I mean, you could tell by exactly. the way he would take that. Kevin Millar looks at 0-1-1 away, bounces away from Krasinski, but Nixon will stay put. You say, okay, so Olerud, such a good hitter and such a tough fork ball and stuff to hit, why isn't the lefty in there today? And with uh, Burley, the lefty, why wouldn't Millar go tomorrow? It's going to be backwards for Boston because Kevin Millar, 6 for 14 with two homers against Contreras. It's the old computer, got him. <laughs> no question. Back to see Ola Root start tomorrow, as we said, lefty versus lefty. Yeah. 
I don't care if you hit from both sides of the plate at the yeah. same time. That's a tough pitch to hit. No, nope. absolutely. He's really come around. I, he just he looks so much more comfortable, Mike, here than than, than what he was in New York. And you, you think about you know uh, the guy came from Cuba to all of a sudden now, you know, uh, with the New York Yankees, uh, it, it, it's a difficult adjustment. He really feels at home here with the White Sox. Way to Millar holds off that one two and two. You'll see especially in these when he's ahead in the in the count. He's even counts two two expanding the strike zone and and especially with that split I mean or the fork ball you want downward action on that pitch. You don't want that pitch to kind of stay in the strike zone. Plus the fact he throws ninety seven. Yeah. yeah that's, that's from. They rings him up. And Millar will have a word with John Hirschbeck. Mike, that strike zone is going to stay big all afternoon. Both teams knew it, though, coming into the game. That looked like a two-seamer. Actually, turned the ball over a little bit. Had a little sink on it. 94 with me. Yeah. That's a great arm. He's always had great stuff. Now Bill Miller, who has had success. Most of these Red Sox have had success against Contreras in his life, primarily as a New York Yankee. Contreras against Boston, if you want to look look it up, two and four, an ERA of over 11. You know, that's some other years, but they feel good about it. But they're looking up at a big deficit, five nothing. They're looking also at a big guy out there at the mound, six four, two forty five, and Miller holds off. Krasinski's pretty much doing everything right now. I'd say he's, he's got to be the front runner in our player of the game, huh? That's that's a great job there. You to go out on a limb like that already? All right, now. You know me. I've been known to change my opinion. Yeah. Nice block there. You see, he turned the glove over. Didn't get stiff. Try to get like a pillow. You know that ball's gonna hurt, but you have to relax and not get tense because that you get tense, that ball's gonna bounce off you. Good eye there, Miller backing away of that. Nixon's at first. Miller can work his way on. You never know. You have to get five in a hurry. You have to get something. And that'll be foul. This is such a good situational hitter, Billy Miller there, Mike. I mean, he had to count in his favor. He looked in. He just, you know, he pulled the ball down yeah. the line. Yeah, you're trying to get something, trying to ignite the team, you're trying to get the offense going. Big hit, walk. We always have an expression in the dugout. Don't help him out. Don't help him out. Don't expand the strike zone. Allow him to make him make good pitches. Crowd getting to its feet on the 2-2 pitch. Good eye again, Miller. Now the count full, so Nixon can be off on the pitch. And two with Boston. I mean, there's a lot of game left. You know, they want to creep back into the game. You know, you're not going to get it back with one swing. You get a run here, a run there, make it, keep them close. And even if they don't score in, in, in this inning right here, if they can get his pitch count up to yes. around 30, he's not going to throw a complete game. Now force the hand. Little chopper handled by Gucci over to Canerco, and no goes the Red Sox. So they strand one heading to the bottom of the second. Five nothing Chicago. Chris Berman, Rick Sutcliffe, Mike Piazza, Aaron Andrews with you here at U.S. Cellular Field in Chicago. The White Sox scored five times in the first swing at the first pitch. Juan Uribe. Good hitting shortstop. And it's handled by Graffinino at second base. One pitch, one down, and that's a sigh of relief for Matt Clement. Well, it is, but here comes the guy that started it all in the bottom of the first. Back to home plate again, Scott puts sudden it. Strike with Sednik, hit by pitch, sacrificed over, stole a third, scored on a fielder's choice. That's innocuous. At the end of the inning, four two out runs. To center field, Damon won't get it. 
Sedgwick aboard the second time. Down to Aaron Andrews. Aaron? All right, guys, I'm here right now with the big hurt, Frank Thomas. I know you'd love to be out there right now, and we'll get to your injury in just a minute, but put a five spot on the Boston Red Sox. Your thoughts about that? That's great. I Like I told people, um, this team went through a lot the last two weeks of the season. Uh, that builds character. Um, they got hot at the right time at the end of the week and rolled into the playoffs. And this time of the year is normally the hot team's going to win this thing. There's a lot of talk about how Contreras would handle this first start. What do you think of him out there so far? Oh, he's been great the whole second half. Um, he's found a home here. He's more relaxed. He's always had that excellent stuff, but now he's, all, he's put it all together, and he's happy, and he's comfortable, and he's pitching like he's capable. A lot of people were wondering how the White Sox would handle the pressure because they haven't had experience like the Red Sox. You've been in the playoffs before. What have you told some of these guys? Well, you know, with Ozzy, he's, he's made things so loose with this, this team all year long, and it's been a total team effort. Uh, from day one, it's been all about the team. So uh, these guys have really put it together and uh, played as a team, as a unit all year, and that's why we had the success with that. You missed a great part of this season with that ankle injury. you got a cast on right now. Can you give us an update on what's going on with you? Um, right now, everything looks great. The x-rays look wonderful. Um, I'm probably two, three weeks from getting out of the cast and uh, start my re rehabilitation, and uh, that's going to be key for me. Uh, but I'm going to be here with this team, and, and, and we'll help we'll, through, through the end here. Hopefully, we can get a World Series championship this year. You threw out the first pitch. Ozzy was wondering, how do you do? How would you rate yourself? That was pretty good, a little high. <laughs> But uh, that, that's the most nervous I've been in a long time. Uh, I thought getting a hit was a lot of, lot of nerve-wracking thing, but uh, throwing out the first pitch was great. Hey, take care of yourself. Thank you. Pleasure, Aaron. Thank you. Guys? Aaron, Frank, thank you very much. Well, maybe if they uh, have bullpen problems, Frank can uh, work out of there, huh? He wants to play next year. You know, he was telling both of us that before the game. I mean, he's determined to come back and... Uh, well, what an offensive player, Mike, he's been throughout his career. Oh, just a force. Look at his size. Started swinging the bat with a lot of authority the last couple of years. Back the way he was. Bluffing is that Shednick at first and Gucci fouls him. That's what we were talking about earlier. I mean, just the speed of Putsednik at first base. I mean, Mike, what a great pitch that was for Gucci to take a swing at it. Oh, right down the middle. Pulled up. <laughs> Look at his expression. <laughs> he knew it. He knew I missed it. my cookie. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we always say. I don't think he's going to shut down the running game, game as well. You can't. Gucci, kind of a defensive swing on the two-strike pitch. Let's see what Ozzy's doing, who is a pretty good base stealer. See what he's saying there? That's Clement's first move to home plate is with that shoulder. When he starts to close the shoulder, Ozzy's telling Pacetnik, that's what you look for. Don't look at his legs. Don't look at his hands. Watch that front shoulder. When it starts to close, that's when you take off. Clement will keep a look at Pacetnik, who was second to Sean Figgins in stolen bases this year. He had 59 to Figgins is 62. He had the most stolen bases of anybody last two years. But, Boomer, I agree with what Mike's saying right now. Let him steal second base. You, you need to make some good pitches right here. Or the next thing you know, you're going to get out of sync. You're going to make a mistake, and somebody's going to hit another three-run homer. There he goes. Veritek throw. It's a good one. Gone. But he just stood up and fired. And that was even a high throw, yeah. so that got down there in a hurry, Mike. Well, if the ball got to home plate in a hurry, Mike, wouldn't it? It's a high fastball, pretty good pitch not to the, handle. Not the greatest jump in the world, but Jason right there just took his time, made a nice throw. See, not a lot of motion on him, on Jason there. Let the ball travel. You can't go out and get the ball fast, and the ball's going to come to you, and he stood back and used his legs and made a beautiful, beautiful throw to second. You know what? Can you get in a base-stealing slump? Yes, it's called late in the year, and you're tired. Uh, nine of his last 23, not including, and he's one for two today. Well, sure. I mean, you know, it, it's like anything. It's it's any athletic movement, any pitch, any, you have to be able to throw, uh, let it flow, and I think he's just a little mechanical right now, and as Ozzy was trying to get him going, you know, look look at his sign. Every pitcher has a tell uh, when he's going home and when he's going to first base. It could be the shoulder. It could be the back heel. It could be, uh, you know, his hips. The line the shields told me he used to look at the guy's uh, rear end. Every time he looked at a, a you know, in a certain movement, it would be coming to first and obviously sure. going to, to home. So he's got to get back to that uh, sign that helps him. Ball hit well by Gucci, and Damon sliding makes the grab. And Clement... Survives inning number two. We played two here in Chicago. Five.
Five nothing. The White Sox lead the Red Sox here as we head to the top of the third on a summer like day in Chicago. Tony Graffinino, Johnny Damon, Edgar Renneria. And uh, we should uh, say to those celebrating the Jewish New Year, Happy New Year to everybody. Happy Rosh Hashanah. Tony Graffinino, the number nine batter. Big pickup in the middle of the season, like night and day from Kansas City to Boston. Uh, has been in the postseason earlier on in his career in Atlanta. And uh, Tony's just a gutsy guy. And hits this well down the line, and that's fair. But Sednick will go over to get it. But Graffinito with a stand-up double, and Boston perhaps in business. Johnny Damon and A.J. Pruszynski, high school teammates in Orlando. You know they got something riding on this series. He's the same guy, you know. He's uh, real smug, very misunderstood. You know, uh, um, I, I love him. I love him to death. Um, he lives. In the same neighborhood that I live in, and you know, whoever loses this series, um, we're going to have uh, the other person get their house set up for the uh, for the winner. So a uh, bunch of sodas, uh, load up the refrigerator with beers, um, just uh, kind of a a small bit. <laughs> Sounds like a good party. That sounds like a good neighborhood. <laughs> yeah. Stock my fridge with beers <laughs> anytime you want. So now Damon trying to do something about the, the party. But Contreras, with other ideas, is ahead 0-2. I think it's real important here. When Boston has to chip away at this lead, they could squeeze this run across, try to give him a little bit of momentum. Contreras keeps throwing those pitches, though. It's going to be tough. And he just gets the bat there. You know, Johnny doing a lot of work. Just one arm swinging with the shoulder injury he's had. Although he says, "Hey, I, I kind of do more of that than you think." But I, it looks like a, a power backhand sometimes. It's, it's been a tough year, Boomer, for Johnny Damon. He's had stitches in his eye. He's had them in his elbow, leg problems, shoulder problems, as you mentioned. But he's as healthy now as he's been in a while. Punched out by Hirschbeck. And speaking of Damon and Persinski, I wonder what. Krasinski was saying, okay, Johnny, you're a small ball player. I'm going to come up in the first inning, and I'm going to surprise you, and I'm going to bunt. Hey, guys, supposing that bunt was fair, we never would have had this. It just wonder. tells you how good offensively that A.J. Przinski can be and has been. He, you know, he's a 290 career hitter. His average was down a little bit this year, but his power numbers were up during the regular season. Maybe it was by design. He was just setting a trap. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> yeah, that's why, uh, Mike, I marvel at what the, the White Sox have done this year. When, you know, with, with A.J. in San Francisco, they talked about, uh, you know, he didn't have the right attitude. When you, you look at the lineup, Patsednik, nine years at the minor league level. Uh, Aguchi for Ozzy Gian, uh, his first year, you know, playing over here in the States. Jermaine Dye, is he going to be healthy? Uh, Canerco, would, you know, he got off to a slow start this year. Carl Everett. Renneria lofts one to a short right field. That's Jermaine Dye with two outs. And Graffinino back to second. The Red Sox have had a runner every inning, but uh, they've just stood right there. So David Ortiz up. And kind of what you were saying, too, Rick. I mean, you know, I, I hate that word chemistry. It's so overused. It's, it's such a cliche in, in sports today. But uh, the bottom line is if you're comfortable and you're happy where you're working and you have a good relationship with the guys and you have fun and you're able to eat and yeah, it just it makes the workplace more more productive and, and just like any business and especially in, on a team you know and going into that clubhouse today as we all did before the game what, what a great coaching staff Ozzie Guillen has put together to to communicate with players Joey Cora with some of the young Latin players Harold Bain one of the best guys on earth Don Cooper uh, the pitching staff raves about him and you know Harold Bain I mean there's a, that guy's a winner yeah. I mean, he's a terrific hitter, a terrific player, and, you know, there's a lot of young players that can go to him for help. Tim Raines, Greg oh. Walker, they all, they're, they're all were White Sox. They all <laughs> are, are vestiges of, of good times in the past. They've been on teams that got the postseason. White Sox don't make it often. Coaching staff is very important. Ortiz, all with the shift that's going to make it tough, and Arebe can't handle it. 
with that shift, as good an arm as Uribe had, he knew he had to hustle, would have had to turn, and what did you say, Mike? Huh? That's what I was saying. I mean, the shift, obviously important. You have the tendencies on the hitters. When you get a regular ground ball to shortstop off the end of the bat, and look where he has to go to run to catch his ball. All the way across the field, and then throw across his body to first base. So even with David Ortiz running, it's still a tough play. He's playing a regular position or even a shaded position. He can come straight in on that ball and make that play. And this for Boston Boomer is so good offensively. Now look at who's at home plate. Yeah. I mean, one mistake from Contreras, and the next thing you know, Boston could be right back in this. A bunch of homers the last week and a half for Manny Ramirez. Three the last two games over the weekend against the Yankees. Two on, two out. Red Sox trail 5-0, but here's Ramirez. Broken bat. Creedy over to Aguchi, and they get Ortiz, and so much for that rally. Contreras stymies the Red Sox again, 5-0. Back in Chicago, it's 5-0 White Sox, bottom of the third, and uh, graciously joining us, the manager of the world champion Boston Red Sox, Terry Francona. Tito, now how do you gauge Clement? Uh, any more rope for him at this point in a 5-0 game? Well, I think we got to give him some rope. I mean, the, the last thing we want to do is go through our whole bullpen on game one. He's got the stuff to kind of gather himself. Um, I mean, we don't want to let them extend this lead much, but the best thing we can do is have him find himself and, and get it right, and then we can start using our bullpen to try to win the game, not just to, just, just to get through innings. Terry, has your hitters been talking at all about the shadows with the fourth ball of Contreras? How difficult is it to see right now? Yeah, I've asked a couple of the guys, and they don't seem to think it's as much of an issue. I mean, I can't see it from in here. When the ball is hit, I'm losing it, but they don't seem... He's made some good pitches. I don't think it's so much a shadow right now. Do you think that uh, you've seen something in Contreras that, uh, that makes you think that maybe you work some pitch counts, which Manny didn't do, that... Uh, you can hack away at him. You know what, Boomer? He's seen fastball and then a split, and he's seen both of them. And he, he's a smart enough hitter. He just hasn't. He just hasn't hit him. Um, what I've seen enough is in our team that we'll keep playing. We know that. We've all seen it. Thanks, Terry. All right, guys. Very gracious. Very just a good fellow, whether he's up or down. And it was. A, make no mistake about it. I know. Okay, for five months of the season, it was a party in Boston. They finally won. I mean, they're in first place. Etc. But the, it, this was a 162 game grind, and he said he had about 12 hours to enjoy the whole season. You know, not getting in until he actually had four innings. The Cleveland score with the White Sox actually did them the favor. Was a final with about what four innings to go in the Yankee game, and he said he didn't know how to act. Right? We were talking to him before the game. It's just like somebody kicked him in the stomach and said, "Hey, relax, will you? Enjoy the hour." <laughs> Tough. And that demeanor, that attitude comes across on the team. He's not in panic mode right now. He knows his team could come back. Meanwhile, Matt Clement, you heard what he said about Clement. He's, He's got to give him innings. Yep. Because look, the way it sets up, if it goes around the horn, that'll work again. You don't want to. Yes. Right? Well, it's twofold. You want to continue to, to get these innings, these, these innings when you're behind. And you also want to give him some positive to go out on when he does come out of the game. Because again, if it goes five, that would be who He's they would be see there. again. Plus, let's face it, as Tremaine Guy fouls it. Boston's bullpen is not deep. It's not, it's not the kind where you got five or six guys that are, you know, they, they patchwork that all year. Yeah, I think it's, it's been their big problem all year long. Last year, particularly in the postseason, Keith Falk was, was so good. And they have basically been without him all year long. Mike Timlin now the closer, but then you take Timlin out of the, the setup role that he was so good at. Well, as good as a closer. Remember last year, you know, Alan Embry was a key a pitcher for them. Uh, had trouble for really the four months in Boston. Now a member of the Yanks. Uh, some of, you know, Schilling went back there. Now he's the starter. We'll see Schilling in game four. They're going with Jonathan Papelbon as almost the setup, or one of the two setup guys. Boy, hearing, hearing them talk about Papelbon before the game, they have a lot of confidence in him, Boomer. Die lifts this way up in the air. Back goes Manny Ramirez in the sun, and he grabs it just in front of the track. You know, Boomer, we've talked about Max Lemet being in the All-Star game, off to a great start for Boston, and what really turned his season around was in Tampa Bay. Mike, we remember this. Uh, Crawford's up, and I mean, that's just, oh, look how far that ball goes. And 
just to me remarkable as we look at Matt Clement being carried off the field after that ball game mm -hmm. that he's even Mike he's even back pitching right now. Yeah, it shows a lot of guts a lot of intestinal fortitude because in, invariably you're going to have you're going to shy away from contact yeah. and that's going to affect your mechanics. You're not going to be able to release the ball where you want to. You're not going to have that follow through. You're going to feel exposed and it just takes a while to get over that anxiety and he's talked about it. He is going to change his mechanics over the winter. It's impossible to do during the season right now but he finishes off to the side that big leg kick. He you know he's got a lot of power in those legs. He pushes off real hard but it kind of leaves him open to anything that would be hit back up the middle again and boomer I I don't care who you are, it's, it's going to change things. One and one to Paul Konerko, who drove in the first room of the fielder's choice, just missed a three run home run earlier. You know, oddly enough, for Clement, his season, I don't want to say went south, but it was not the same as the first half. Boston starting that game won 14 of 16. O oddly enough, how that they rallied at the time, that was their best hot streak of the season. Deep to left, back it goes. Didn't miss this one, gone. We told you at the outset, like Big Poppy and like Manny Ramirez, Canerco's had two straight seasons of 40 plus home runs. He almost hit one in his first at bat. He hits one right there. Paul here with just a nice short stroke. Head down on the ball. Just drop the head of the bat on the ball. Didn't try to do too much. The first ground ball, I think he pulled over. He kind of rolled over the pitch a little bit. Learned a lesson on that one. Oh, and Clement gets hit again. This time by Carl Everett. He recovers beautifully. Wow. Now everybody going to be out to take a look, including the trainer, including the skipper. That was a jump great, right on the ball. That huh? was a great play to throw him out right there. I'll tell you. Here he is to take a look at it now. I mean, look, there's nothing to protect himself. His glove, everything is off to the side. The ball hits him in the leg. He goes and gets it. But when he got done with the throw, Mike, he looked into the dugout as if, you know what, something seriously could be bothering him again. What was the worst incident you guys were either involved with either set you taking one or Mike either hitting one or being behind the plate when you saw one. Oh well, boy. You know I mean they're all anytime it involves anything from the neck up boomer it's they're all scary. I mean you just you never know how a guy is going to respond and you know you mentioned the number commit 10 and 2 before the all star break finishing up with just three wins after that. I, there's no question that line drive did change things yeah. and he's going to have to change his mechanics so that he can get away from that. Seems to be okay. And he says, I'm fine. Yeah. Well, as we were talking earlier about his release and 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 have, being in a ready position, not only does it allow you to make better quality pitches, but also to field your position. And you, Rick, you know as well as anybody, if you can field your position, once you release the ball, you're an infielder. And when you've got a guy like Clement, his out pitch, his best pitch is that sinking fastball. Boomer, he's going to get a lot of ground balls. You'd like to be in a position like a Maddox or a Hampton to be able to do something with it. Aaron Rowan singled and was aboard A.J. Pruszynski's three-run home run in the first inning. Just watching that last pitch, Mike. I mean, that's not the normal finish of Matt Clement. Watch what happens as he throws it. He knows he leaves it there. Look at, see how he flinches yeah, right almost there? almost short-armed it a little bit. Exactly. Certainly can understand it. Oh. Yes. And the swing side, as we were saying, about having a lead now is if you're Chicago, you can afford to be more aggressive. You can roll the dice. You can go ahead and try and pop one out of the ballpark because 3-2, two, 2-2 two, two, two game, close game. Now they can just go ahead and uh, go for the pump. See Paul Konerko there. You know what? There's a dilemma in Cranston, Rhode Island right now where yeah. his grandma lives. He, grew, he was born in Rhode Island and moved to Connecticut. I mean, he, he ended up moving to Arizona at 11, but what's has got about dilemma? a dozen family members. They were happy. It's thrilled for him, but 
you got to think Cranston Rhode Island uh, happy for him but all oh, the Red Sox and it uh, they're happy for him that's grandma blood is thicker than mud yep <laughs> <laughs> I'm pulling for my boy, right? Well, uh, you've known him a long time. Yeah. Came up as a Dodger with a can't miss, right? Like, yeah. We were talking about that. Hey, you're going to be the next rookie of the year. That's tough. Yeah, they did. They put a lot of pressure on him and eventually traded him. Wow. Rowan just hammers that, but Ramirez is there. Long ball by Paul Conurco, and the White Sox have made it a touchdown. It's a fun afternoon here for the Chicagoans at the uh, fundamentals out there in the bleachers. Look, this park is never going to be at the top of your list. It's the best park in the majors, but they have done a very good job the last few years of making it more fan-friendly, just better place to go watch a game. It's different than the park that opened up in 1991, the new Comiskey, uh, replacing the old Comiskey Park, which is across the street. They actually kept the place where home plate was. You can walk over there, not see the plate, but... The in a little bit of pavement and it's more fun and boy when the home team in the playoffs is leading six nothing that you can play it in a uh, in a garbage dump and everybody could have fun right yeah this was the first of the new era stadiums and a uh, little bit of criticism on its design there's track Nixon for his second hit of the day so Nixon gets on again the Red Sox have had to run her to every inning uh, but the long ball and short ball being done by the Chicago White Sox. Mike Piazza joining Rick Sutcliffe and yours truly, Chris Berman, Aaron Andrews on the field. And about the way Chicago came out smoking, huh? I, I think a, a lot goes into what happened, though, going into this postseason, Boomer, when they had an opportunity to set their rotation up. You got your best pitcher the, the second half of the year, Contreras, on the mound. You got Burley going tomorrow, who has been dominant at home. You got Freddie Garcia going in Boston. He's been tremendous on the road. Veritek with a bunt, and Creedy won't get it, and that ball's booted away, and Nixon has a chance to go to another base, as does Veritek. So the White Sox usually uh, are not playing like that. They play very good defense, but a little bunt from the catcher, maybe down 6 nothing, surprised him, and now Boston may be in some business. Mike, I think we're seeing some things out of respect for Contreras. We're seeing Manny Ramirez swinging at the first pitch, getting himself out, and with the called strikeout on Veritek in his last at bat, clearly overmatched, he says, you know what, I gotta, I gotta try something different, and it worked. Probably took a peek down there, just gave it a shot, rolled the dice, dropped one down there, and now you got a uh, scoring situation here for Boston. So runners at second and third, none out. Kevin Millar up. And Kevin really for him, the type of seasons he's had in Boston, had a power outage. Nine home runs. They don't need a home run here. Just a little bleeder. Get two on the board is what they're after as uh, Contreras starts him off with a strike. Well, Boomer, like you say, Millar's in here for one reason in that lineup. He's in here to hit. I mean, he's hit a couple of home runs off Contreras. Uh, if they get the lead, Boston, late in the game, you know that Olderud would come in then, but they want him to swing the bat. Contreras right there throwing him two, two seamers on the inside part of the plate. As we try to say, as we try to speed him up a little bit, get him thinking on the inside, and now you can go ahead back up away out of the strike zone. Chicago here obviously conceding a run. They need outs. Away, and that one bounces to the screen, and scoring is Nixon. Over to third, Veritek. Now they got 910 runs during the regular season, and uh, a lot of them came not that way, but they'll take it. Boston on the board. Well, 0-2 pitch here, out of the strike zone, almost impossible to block. You really have to shift. You could just throw your glove at it and hope it sticks, but there's nothing really you can do on that pitch. Rick. A little single, a punt single, air while pitch Boston on the board. Top foul. 20 wild pitches, Contreras, this year. He and Freddie Garcia tied for the most in the league. Well, just like what, what Mike said, there's nothing that a catcher could have done there. And uh, the, the White Sox have been so good defensively all year. You know, a bunt single, they kick it. You put runners on base, you put pressure on the opposing team. And a couple of runs, it looks like they're going to get already just on gifts. 
Ball hit well to right field. Jermaine Dye not going to get it. Veritek scores. Millar went a long way the opposite way, and he's in with a double. 6-2. I have to take it, Mike, those first two fastballs in. It's almost like Millar had a game plan all along. He's going to look for something away. He got something soft. He gets a little slider there. Brzezinski and Contreras not with the confidence to go with the fork ball. That was, that was a great at bat by Kevin Millar. Oh, you're right. He did not, uh, he didn't sell out there. He had a plan, stayed with it. He said, I'm looking for soft something away. He threw him two firm fastballs the inside part of the play, and he I, still was not afraid to hit with two strikes. Really, exactly. That was the first guy that we've really seen like that. He, he didn't go away from his game plan when he fell behind. Interesting, the skipper out, not the pitching coach. Ozzie Gian out to the mound to talk with Contreras. Of course, uh, might have a better chance of actually talking, although Contreras <laughs> is okay with English, but, you know, Ozzy's Spanish probably <laughs> better than Contreras' English with Tom Cooper, the pitcher. That's just a guess. I think you're correct. Bill Miller up. Millar at second. Two runs home. The Red Sox have actually out-hit Chicago 7-5, but they... Uh, Trail at 6-2. Still no outs in this inning. Chicago needs some outs right here. So you could find yourself on the end of a very crooked number. Miller did not offer in there for a strike with the ball. I'll be talking before the game about, you know, no one thought that Contreras would be his number one guy. And the thing that he constantly has to remind Contreras of is the fact that you've got to be aggressive. And for Contreras, Mike, that means to use his fastball. And that's that's what he did on that last pitch. Hit hard by Miller. And they're going to try to get the lead runner. And they do it. Wow, a Gucci over to Creedy. And I think Millar was surprised as anyone. Boomer, it's just really frustrating when, Mike, you can't run, you know? <laughs> he, he does the right thing here. The ball was hit behind him. A great piece of hitting by Bill Miller. He's going as hard as he can go. He just, he, he can't he can't get there. He's still short hopped the throw, but saw that he didn't get a great jump off the bat. The ball was hit very firm. Great play to dig it out, tag him out. <laughs> what are you doing? Yeah. Yeah, way to go, kind of. I think he just saw that ball going past the third base into the wow. <laughs> With all the other things that have happened defensively this inning. We'll take it. Tony Graffinino up. He said that he had postseason experience as a youngster with Bobby Cox and the Atlanta Braves. His last postseason appearance was here with the White Sox in 2000 series that you and I did Rick and the White Sox were swept by the Seattle Mariners I think the White Sox already have more runs in the first three innings than they did in those three games against Seattle offensively they just were shut down by Lou Pinella's team and Boston's uh, impressing me here with their approach as well as being aggressive, they could take pitches, but also put the ball in play and find those spots they need to. Foul play. Two runs home, a potential run cut down at the third. There's the uh, Matt Clement. Well, he's had quite a experience on the mound. Long ball, the shot that he took. You he heard what Terry Francona said. We're going to pitch him. Check swing. And it certainly will be too slow to turn two. Surprised they even tried it. So the lead runner is gone. Graffinito on a fielder's choice. And Aaron Andrews with uh, some on the Red Sox pitcher. Aaron? We're still trying to see what the trainers can tell us. They said they'll let us know shortly. But Matt Clement has been sitting with David Wells on the bench, just kind of laughing, joking around, having a good time. He did get up earlier when he came to the dugout. Looked like he was moving rather gingerly. But Wells asked him how he was doing, and he said he was doing okay. We'll let you know if there's any other news, guys. Well, if you want to feel better, you sit next to David Wells, <laughs> yeah. I guess. That's... Uh... I don't know if he's the, quite the doctor that you need in this situation. That certainly has the, the proverbial game face on. He wants Johnny Damon in there for a strike. 
Todd, I go to something, and you guys were talking about the way Contreras is pitching. We met with Ozzie Guillen before the game. What did he talk about when we asked about Contreras? He's now a fastball pitcher with a forkball rather than a forkball pitcher with a fastball when we first got him. And we explain what that really means and what we're seeing out here today, guys. Well, he's just not a two-pitch guy. Like Mike was talking about, he's using two different types of fastballs as well, but he's being aggressive. Staying in the zone, they really haven't hit the ball hard this inning off of him. They've kicked it around a little bit, but he's got a chance to get out of here and still have a four-run lead. Damon ahead of that one, and he strikes out. So the Red Sox get a pair, but uh, another high. Th that mini Minoso, oh, they brought them all back here. It's been a party this far in Chicago. The Red Sox have pecked away with a couple of runs. But now here's the hitting star for the White Sox, the catcher, A.J. Prusinski, who in the first inning hit a three-run homer to the left center field seats. Opposite way, with two out, took a 2-0 game, made it 5-0 against Matt Clement. Well, if he's going to bunt, this is not a bad spot. <laughs> Ignite another rally. Well, that doesn't look like a bunt to us. Mm. He rattles it down the right field line. Trot Nixon over with it. Przinski into second. Homer now double for the catcher. I could go to the opposite field and I could pull the ball. Fastball cut a little bit towards the inside part of the plate. And he's quick enough to get it in the corner. It was almost Mike like he went up there on the first pitch just kind of looking at the way they were going to approach him. Yeah. He saw the first pitcher cut her in. He said, all right, you know, you, that's what you want to do. I, you know, I'll, I'll look for that pitch and try to hit it. Yeah, he is locked in right now. Yes, he say. is. Yes, he is. And you can pull the ball and you hit the ball the other way. Now here is the third baseman for the Chicago White Sox. And he talked to him before the game, Joe. Six feet from the edge, Creedy. <laughs> he said both the band and he appreciate the nickname. Trying to be modern here, Mike, and I'm trying to keep up. Much more important than that. He uh, up, well, squirts away from Veritek. He uh, missed a couple of games, did Creedy, uh, this last week, but with good reason. His wife gave birth to their second daughter. They live out on a farm in Missouri. He went home to be with her and got two young girls under the age of two. He said, You're a real dad now. and He's all smiles talking about it, and now he gets to come back, and the team, had, he, you know, lost sleep for a couple days, but they haven't lost since he's come back. So good luck all the way around for the Creedy family. Congratulations. Hopefully his wife didn't put him on diaper patrol. He'll be on it soon enough. <laughs> Lofts it to right. Tagging his Przinski bluffs. Nixon with a strong arm. I think it all goes back, Boomer, the, the problems Matt Clement has had today with, the, you know, the very first hitter. After he hit Podsednik with that cut fastball there, he, he was just all over the place. He tried to get quick to home plate to keep Podsednik from stealing second base. He eventually stole third, and then Matt Clement just never able to settle in. I mean, Mike, you look at the glove of Jason Veritek, and it, it's constantly moving. Yeah. It's almost like he's catching a knuckleballer to <laughs> a Wakefield. Now that's Chad Bradford, a knuckle scraper from the right-hand side, a submariner. They've got one from each side. Bradford, the righty, Mike Myers, the lefty. Juan Uribe looks at a breaking ball in there for a strike. you got to admire the toughness, though, of from that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, with what happened to him earlier in the year down in Tampa, a lot of people don't even come back from that. Uh, they, they're never the same. And, you know, and then he gets drilled here earlier in the game and then still refuses to come out. But he's still struggling to command that fastball. They have no trouble. And as Terry said, it's staying with him, keeping him in the game, trying to get some positive. An outing from him that he can be at least go into the clubhouse with a little bit of positive energy there. Well, when you look at how these teams were set up, yeah. you know, six extra guys for the Boston Red Sox, which means you're going to have one left pitcher. Only five extra guys for the Chicago White Sox. Their, their bullpen's a lot deeper, but when you look at the rotation of Boston, you, you, the last thing you would expect is that you're going to need extra help in the bullpen. Hit well by Arebe. Back it goes. Back, back, back. Good! 
again. Another White Sox home run. There were about a half a dozen White Sox players who, when we asked, are what guy that's, you know, off the radar could come through in a big way for you, just about all of them said that guy hitting from the nine hole, Arebe. Juan Arebe here likes the ball close to him. Just blew open those hips, got that bat through the zone. Once again, though, Veritek wanting the fastball up and in yeah. off the plate, and Clement not able to get it there. And activity in the Boston bullpen right now. You just you don't know how much longer Terry Francona is going to stick with his starter. So those two runs that Boston got to make it 6-2, now 8-2, and the answer is no longer. Here comes Francona and a rough outing for a very game pitcher in Matt Clement. But he gave up a three-run, a two-run, and a solo home run. And the White Sox have the hitting shoes on. Clement is gone here in the fourth. So was that ball hit by Uribe. 8-2. Popped around by Brzezinski, by Konerko, by Uribe, and Matt Clement is gone here in the fourth. And any pitcher would like to tie a record uh, set by Roger Clemens. This isn't one of them. Most uh, runs allowed in a postseason start, eight. Roger in one of his starts in 1986 against the uh, Angels. So, Matt Clement, there'll be better days, and if it goes five, he'll, he'll probably be out there. You know, and Boomer, not his first postseason experience, though. He was in the playoffs back in 03 with the Cubs. He lost in a divisional series, and that game he was just wild. He walked a lot of people, but he came back, and he beat the Florida Marlins right. in the league championship series. Uh, to me, the ironic part, he gave up all those runs, and Mike, like you said, during the break, he didn't walk anybody. Well, you don't figure him giving up this amount of runs and not having a few walks wrapped in there. But it's evident that uh, Chicago's approach today offensively was just to shrink the strike zone. Yep. And they took some pitches, but, you know, they also got pitches to hit. Well, he hit two batters, so that's likely. Yeah. Walk. Right off the Here's bat. Chad Bradford in with an, and the pitch is going to come kind of well, not both directions, but here's another one where, right, if you're behind the plate, it's all boy. Yeah. No, it's a tough day today for Jason. He's working his uh, his tail off. And these guys always give me fits. I, I really have problems with submarine guys. Wish I'd have known that. You would have dropped down. <laughs> well, you know, as a hitter, you want to swing at the ball, not the motion, but... Traditional, these guys balls a lot of sink to it. They try to get a lot pitches are real soft, and you'll see the body come across and you flinch at it a little bit and get out of your game as a hitter. Bradford gloves it. Sednick retired. Two outs here in the White Sox fourth. Here's a look. That's what I was saying. Watch this release point. It's almost like softball. Sednick pulls off that pitch, hits it off the end of the bat. Reminds me of, of some of the, the, the great closers, the Dan Quisenberrys, uh, the Kent Tocolvies. Guys down in that angle, just, just so deceptive. And of course, easier said than done. Everyone's a swing at the ball, not the motion. And you have someone 6-0, six, 6-3 six, <laughs> jumping at you from the mound, and, and the balls just disappear almost deceptively coming out of his uniform somewhere. Boston can do that from both sides yep. of the mound. Yep. Mike Myers down there. A lot of scraped knuckles that the trainer has to deal with. Though, doesn't he? Bradford came over in the middle of the season uh, in a trade with Oakland for Jay Payton. So he to Gucci. He's 0 for 2, but had a strong throw to third behind Millar that, you know, in an 8-2 game at this moment, you can overlook it. But gambled and won. Uh, killed some momentum for Boston. Mm -hmm. Riguchi, a uh, star in the Japanese leagues, three-time gold glover over in Japan, a four-time all-star. 
over there, a 30-year-old rookie. And he really opened up eyes here in Chicago. Play he's more than he's ever played in Japan. It's not like they only play 100 games, but by going now into the postseason, they will play 170-odd games over in Japan, so keep an eye on him. He's going to get some votes for the American League Rookie of the Year. I, I, I kind of feel like uh, Hudson Street out in Oakland will probably win that award. The last Rookie of the Year for the Chicago White Sox, their skipper, Ozzie Guillen. Still young. You know, if he could just relax a little bit, Ozzie. You know, <laughs> He's still have young. Have a little fun. Don't be so stoic. <laughs> Old school. It's interesting who you learn from. And uh, Gucci learned that Bradford's going to strike him out. So Bradford comes in and quells the rally, but two more home for the White Sox. 8-2. Back in Chicago, Jose Contreras with an 8-2 lead for the White Sox as we hit the top of the fifth. 2-3-4 for Boston. Edgar Renneria, Big Poppy, David Ortiz, and Manny Ramirez. And uphill climb, to say the least, at this point. So within four, and a man in scoring position, cut down. Then a rebase home run now regains the six-run lead for Chicago. Omar Jose Contreras. A lifetime has struggled against Boston, but I don't know that he had eight runs to work with through four innings uh, that often either. He's just a completely different guy than the guy that struggled in the past. He, he He's so much more aggressive with that fastball in the strike zone, and then when he gets ahead, he gets two strikes, he starts thinking about that strikeout, and Mike, with that fork ball he's got, with the good slider, he's, he's, he's got a lot of ways to go about getting it. And as Ozzie Guillen was saying, uh, before about him establishing his fastball to make his fourth ball better because sometimes there's a tendency you want to take the path of least resistance and it really is work to establish two three quality pitches Renneria hits it sharply but Gucci over to Canerco one down in the Boston fifth I'm really impressed with the, the, the amount of two seam fastballs yeah. he's throwing. You mentioned earlier, Mike, he was a guy that was afraid of contact. And, and, and the two seam fastball to me has always been like a surrender pitch. Mm -hmm. I'm not surrendering the fact that you're going to get a hit, but I'm surrendering this at bat. I'm not throwing you another pitch. I'm going to throw a sinker, and if I get that late movement to it, you're going to hit it on the ground somewhere, and the at bat will be over with. I can get deep into the game. So now here with nobody on, here's the even more exaggerated shift. With a runner on before, we saw the shortstop, Uribe, right behind second. But now, Uribe's on the outfield grass. <laughs> and so is the second baseman, Aguchi. Konerko almost on the grass. And we saw David Ortiz lay a bunt down at a game yeah, that we did on just, Wednesday down the left field. Just to to hit it down the line. If he could bunt at all. Look at that gap between shortstop where the third baseman is now. I mean, look at that. Drive a truck through there. I mean, Creedy's past the shortstop position. Yeah, yeah but I guess, well, I mean, at this point, a homer and a bunt are about the same thing from yeah. Ortiz's angle. They're down. They need runs, not home runs, not with nobody on. Oh. Well, he's that's, just been frustrated that's there. That's unhittable right there. That's like a, a left-handed Steve Carlton slider. You know, we did a game uh, early June in which Contreras pitched against uh, the Angels. And he's working faster even than then. I mean, I'm not only really going back when he first came up with anybody on base. He was slow, wasn't he? With with uh, the Yanks, but he's working quicker even in the last couple months. We saw him last in person. And that's a strategy by pitchers. I mean, don't let the hitter get comfortable. Vary your vary your movements, vary your uh, your timing. Quick pitching. I mean, we we make a joke about it in the dugout. We watch this guy. Oh, quick pitch you. Don't yeah. let him. You know, set the tone. Set set the pace. Step out on him. And that confidence factor. I mean, yeah. if you're Ortiz and you look out the mound and there he is standing there ready to throw another pitch waiting on you to get yeah. in. It, it just builds a little tension in the hitter as well. You don't allow him to relax and drop that bat. Good eye there. 
three and two. The guy you saw very quickly, Mark Burley, speaking of pitching quickly, we'll see him tomorrow. That will be quick. I mean, you know, him and David Wells, that'll be... Uh... The other guy's going to say he's not bad either. Yep. You, you know Boomer's going to get it and throw it. He's not going to yeah, walk yeah, it. That's going to be... We're not going to waste a lot of time there. To right center, but positioned perfectly as Aaron Rowan, and Ortiz is out. He's one for three. Mike, there's a tremendous amount of energy in this crowd here today. I mean, they, Boomer, they had it going from the very beginning. They got here early. And they, what if they didn't get here early? They missed the fireworks in the first <laughs> inning. <laughs> very intense. You might think this organization's like at a crossroads. I mean, they, they want to go forward. They want to prove that they're a winning organization. Had some, some great teams in the 90s. Well, Ken Williams, the general manager, really made a trade that, that Sednick for Carlos Lee that, that changed in some ways the, the, you know, the way they play ball. I mean, I don't have to say that we, we said they hit two. They've hit three homers today. They have more homers than Boston. It's not that they don't hit long ball, but that was a runner for a, for a big-time hitter. And that... Kind of change the face of them a little bit. Well, you live by the sword, you die by the sword. I mean, if you're, your team is built around a three-run home run, uh, it, it, it's just you're one-dimensional. You want to add a little speed. You want to be able to bunt. You want to show the defense different looks. You, you, speed never goes into a slump. You can work a walk and get that guy on base. You can manufacture a run. You want balance. You want balance on your offense. Ramirez to short. Rebay. Rockets it over to Canerco in a 1-2-3 inning for Contreras against the heart of the Red Sox order. 8-2 Chicago. Big lead for the White Sox at the bottom of the fifth. 8-2 over the Red Sox here in game one and joining us now in the White Sox dug out the skipper, Ozzie Gein. And Ozzie, uh, the approach against Matt Clement, was it something you guys saw early? Was it a different approach or... The balls were just up for all the home runs. Well, I think we have to make him throw his strikes and make him uh, get the pitch count. I think uh, the guy surprised me today. We hit that many home runs. Uh, we hit 200 home runs during the season, but really surprised me we hit that many uh, having Clement pitch. Ozzy, your pitcher Contreras struggled in the top of the fourth inning. You went to the mound. What'd you say to him? I just told, forget about the runners. Uh, just eliminate the hitters. Uh, that's more important. I think sometimes Halsey got cut off uh, watching the runners and worry about the runners, not the hitters. Ozzy, we saw you with uh, Scott Pesegna trying to look at the uh, Clement shoulder, and are you just trying to get him to, to, to continue to be aggressive, to, that he could steal those bases? Well, uh, that's the first thing I saw him moving. That's why a lot of people when they're going to steal base, they see a different uh, part of his body. And I was telling him the first thing he moved in the windup before he goes to the plate, he was his shoulder. Well, Ozzy, you came bounding out during the pregame introductions. Looks like the team was running right behind you. Keep it going. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Uh, see you, Venezuela. <laughs> Ozzie Guillen, always a, always a good day. Always a good day at the park. And when you're managing in the postseason and you're the first time and you're up 8-2, that would be a good day. Well, you know, Boomer, he's done a lot of things in the postseason. He, he got there as a player. Jermaine Dye at the middle, Renteria. Millar went out. And you now remember, I, I thought the whole key to that series, when he was the third base coach for the Marlins and they got past the Giants, went on to win the World Championship, they were flat. The Giants had their number. And all of a sudden, there was a base hit to right field. Jose Cruz was the right fielder. He won a gold glove that year. I mean, it was shallow. You, there's no way you should have sent the runner. But Ozzy said, you know what? we got to wake up. We, he sent the runner. It was a bad throw. They scored the run. They won the game. And as they say, the rest was history. It brings a lot of charisma. It brings a lot of energy to the team. You know, that so could be play. good and bad. At times, it could be... Uh, a he little can, over the top, but yep. you know it's, it works. I he think can get re guys get response. Be your best friend, but he'll also yeah. he'll, he'll put that foot in Ooh. your rear if, if he needs to. Ooh, and quickly. Paul Canerco almost homered in the first inning. Drove in a run on a fielder's choice, then did homer in the third inning. You know, Boomer Ozzy, and he, he he says some things that not everybody could get away with. You know what I mean? He said, he told the, the front office when he took over the team two years ago. He said, you know what? You don't take a donkey to the Kentucky Derby. He said, I need some horses. You know, and he was talking about the the, the pitching staff. They traded for Freddie Garcia. They added El Duque. They they added Contreras. And you know, he rode those horses to a 15-game lead on August the first. They got a little tired. 
There were some people down that back stretch started gaining on him, and man, he pulled that whip out again. And you know they would be burying him right now if this team did not make the postseason. I, you need to applaud him for what he was able to do. End result: 162 games, wire to wire, win the division, best record in league. End result. And didn't they open up your eyes and show you something the way they played at Cleveland? I mean, with quote nothing on the line. And an outstanding young Cleveland Indian team. Very yep. aggressive young team. Nurko fouls it. You know, and I asked Ozzy, and I have talked to Don Cooper, a couple of the players about it. They said, you know what? We clinched the division on Thursday in Detroit, and we went into Cleveland, and all of a sudden we saw us. Not like how yeah. we finally saw, oh my God, we were this tight, and that's no disrespect to Cleveland. Cleveland had everything to get, you know, had everything to lose there. And he goes, we, go, we can't play like this. And they played loose, and you said it in the open, Mike. Maybe they found something there in Cleveland. They're certainly putting it to use this afternoon. I mean, I, I think every team has a, a turning point in their season, and every team has a certain moment, or someone said something, or someone gets a big hit, and it just, it just, it just gets you going. It kickstarts your team. Mike, I think right now the big moment in this game was when Ozzy put on the sacrifice bunt in the first inning. But Setnik was on first. He did not put the pressure on him to steal second he was on first in the second and he got thrown out that big inning could could have gone away except for Ozzy you know what let's just get him in the scoring position right now we'll let him maybe run later on mm -hmm. and then boom 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 and Krasinski with the three run homer a big lead two and two to Paul Konerko well, those, those are those intangibles as a manager you have to be able to read your team you have to be able to see who's responding who's tired and and either like you said give him a little kick in the rear put your arm around them yep. I mean it's it's you're a psychologist I mean you're gloved by Bradford Boy, a lot of balls up the middle today Konerko has gone two outs here in the White Sox fifth uh, it's, it's basically the way he's managed all year I mean they have 53 sacrifice bunts this year Boston only 14 if you joined us late the White Sox had quite a party Two runs already home. An opposite field three-run shot by A.J. Pruszynski in the third. Bang. Paul Konerko, who had 40 homers during the regular season, into the bullpen for a solo shot. And then Juan Uribe in the fourth inning, a two-run shot. All that's missing is a grand slam for the home run cycle by the White Sox. Bradford out. Pitching change. Boston. They're getting to sing that na na hey hey steam song again here 8 2 in Chicago where it's been a hitting show for the White Sox Earl Weaver had it kind of right pitching defense and three run homers <laughs> the defense not stellar Chicago the other parts absolutely the pitching has been pretty good yeah here. The pitching and the, the homers have certainly been that way and now Jeremy Gonzalez one time Tampa Bay Devil Ray and oh, Chicago right. Cub and now he's in, and if he can just pitch, he'll be an inning eater now. If Bradford was coming up, well, maybe we get a game and this, but, but now what Francona said, you know, I didn't want to do at this point. Gonzalez could go, he could go three or four. Carl Everett is up. I think that if Boston doesn't get any closer, he's 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 he's, he's, he's going to finish this game. He's here. the closer. It is. In a real high uh, scoring game, we call him the Lamb. He's the, he is the Lamb. <laughs> Everett pops it. Veritek in fair ground, turning every which way, but loose makes the play. Gonzalez gets the out. And the White Sox are gone in the fifth. Heading to the six fans of all ages, enjoying here the 8 2 White Sox lead. Vic Contreras pitching to uh, start this sixth inning. The one guy that's been on a couple times against him, Trot Nixon, offers it the first pitch, and they've retired Trot for the first time this afternoon. So we've already had this afternoon the Cardinals beating the Padres 8-5. We have the White Sox leading here 8-2 in the sixth. Tonight, our friends at Fox, the Yankees and the Angels game one out west at 8 Eastern. And tomorrow, here on ESPN, we've got them all. The Astros and Braves. And how about that, Pettit? Uh, how about that uh, opener? Astros Braves at 4 o'clock Eastern, followed by our game here at 7 o'clock Eastern, 6 o'clock Central. Boomer Wells going against Mark Burley, and then we'll have the Angels and the Yankees at night for the second game. So 4, 7, and 10 Eastern 
mañana here on ESPN. We have a night game tomorrow. Yes, we do. It's a 6 o'clock, a semi, and it's going to be about the last six hours of summer weather here. Front coming through right around. Uh -oh. It's going to be dicey, but oh, what? Bad weather? You think David Wells cares about that? It gets cold. Rick's going to take me shopping. <laughs> I thought I was going to have to do that today. You couldn't get your <laughs> luggage. Veritek pops the second. There are two outs. Boomer, this is impressive right now, Contreras out there. He is just pounding that two-seam fastball in the strike zone. I mean, guys popping up, grounding out on that first pitch. You talked about his numbers. He's won his last eight starts, a ERA of two. How about in his last three starts that he has won? He has pitched 25 innings. I mean, that, that that's a horse. Yeah, look at his dis disposition on the mound. I mean, he's still aggressive. It's easy sometimes when you get a big lead to not to continue to concentrate. That's just what Ozzy told him when he yeah, went out to the mound, you exactly. know? Exactly. Forget about the base runner. Focus on the hitter. He's driving every pitch right through the strike zone here. Millar down the line. Fair ball. Creedy up. Canerco with a scoop. Three up, three down for Contreras again. But Ravi, we know that you and Pedro could be there talking baseball in your sleep. And by the end of this week, probably will be. Still pretty good at it. We look forward to that. As Aaron Rowan, A.J. Pruszynski, Joe Creedy up here for the Chicago White Sox. Matt Clement gone in the fourth, and Bradford dispatched. This is Jeremy Gonzalez now working here to begin inning number six. A lot of changes made this year by the White Sox. As again to begin with, Aaron Rowan. Mike hitting that third spot for a long time. You saw uh, Carl Everett in that. Jermaine Dye in there now. And yet when, you know, we walked around the clubhouse, it, it, it he didn't feel like anybody was upset. I mean, he has a reason for a lot of the things that, that he does. And, uh, you know, it's remarkable the respect that uh, this guy has already gotten in just a second year. By the way, I don't think he cares if anybody's upset oh, talking no. to him. <laughs> he never really knows, right? He, he, you know what? He, and he didn't as a player either. You know, just, just respect. I don't care if you like me or not. Yeah. You're going to respect me because there's, there's going to be a reason for everything that I do. And that reason is the team, <laughs> not the yeah. individual. Yeah. Here's now Chicago. You do not want to get into any bad habits. You want to continue to concentrate, not to expand the strike zone. Because tomorrow night, you may be up with 2-2 game in the bottom of the eighth mm -hmm. inning. So mm -hmm. last thing you want to do is get into a, a lulls or a, in a concentration lapse. Pretty remarkable that they hit a, a 200 home runs again this year, the sixth straight year they've done that. Boomer, when you think about the guys that they lost, Carlos Lee, Maglio Ordonez, there's some power right there. Uh, Valentin, he was a power guy for him. And, of course, the guy we saw throw out the first pitch was injured most of this year, that being Frank Thomas. Mm-hmm. So rumors again in the Yankees. Six years in a row. They'll do it. I think also, too, Rick, what you were saying, I mean, you know, you plug in different guys, and you're just you're looking for that right combination, and, and different per personalities come in, and um, you know, obviously you're going through the numbers as a general manager, as a staff, but sometimes a team that looks good on paper just doesn't play well together. Well, Aaron Ruin gets a base on balls. Here's our pitching summary, brought to you by Yellow Book. Summary for Contreras, outstanding. The last inning, by the way, one, two, three, and six pitches. Matt Clement gave up long balls, gave up eight runs. He was gone inside of four innings. And uh, now, don't have to explain much more than this. One pitcher had it, one did not, eight to two. And it's pretty much been one pitch that Contreras has thrown that has gotten him to that point. That two-seam fastball with a lot of movement, no walks, really hasn't even cared about the strikeout. Now, there's a hit by a pitch, the third White Sox that's been hit, and so Przinski is homered, has doubled, and now aboard again with a hit by pitch. I don't think there's anything to this. I mean, he's having a big day offensively. But oh, once again, Jason Veritek, he might as well not even put the glove up. <laughs> They've not come close to hitting his target all day. Yeah, I don't think there's any message to this pitch. I mean, basically, they're just trying to 
Get him off the plate a little bit. He's feeling a little comfortable. Move his feet. You want to get him out of that rhythm. I mean, he's so locked in right now. So now two on for Joe Creedy. I think you know, it's hard to look at 162 games and you know you don't look back at it till their season's over. But when Cleveland came in here a week and a half ago, hotter than anything, they took two or three from the White Sox. But the game the White Sox won on a home run, on a walk-off home run by Creedy, same game that Uribe made a huge play in the hole. That game, I mean, at the time, Cleveland was still coming. They took two or three, but it just might have stored enough acorns for the winter, if you follow me, and headed off the Indians. It didn't look like it at the time, but you look back, Creedy may have had the biggest swing. Uribe had to play at the club. And as we said earlier, I mean, those are certain things that uh, when you're going through a tough stretch and the team is struggling and you're always, it's kind of like you're always looking to someone else. What, what can you do? What can you do? I mean, because it is, uh, nerves start to get a little uh, prominent there and you need someone to take the pressure off with a big hit, big play, to allow the team to relax and get into that flow again, which got them into that, to that point. I think it's been so easy too, Mike, for this White Sox team to relax all year because they pitched so well. Mm -hmm. That starting rotation, they had they, they were six deep this year with young Brandon McCarthy. This kid's, I mean, 22 years of age, not even on their roster right now. Not but this week. Not might this be in week. The future mm -hmm. if they go on. If they go on, exactly. They might even start a game in the league championship series if they get there. Well, they had Burley, who was, and Garland were automatic. And now we've seen Contreras, the second half is automatic. You know, Mike, better than both of you guys know what that's like. No long losing streaks, right? It is. It's got to be fun, Mike, as a catcher, to put the glove up and know that, you know, the ball's going to be in that area. It's absolutely. Right. And as a ball club, knowing, okay, we're winning tonight. Creedy reaches out for this one. Going back is Graffinino on the grass. Makes the play. Both runners back to the bases. They just didn't pitch well during that three-week period where they they started to fade a little bit. It, kind of funny, you know, the, the, the guy, the starting pit, they, they admitted it. John Garland with a career high in wins this year. You know, with Burley, he's, uh, you know, nobody's thrown more innings than he has, but they hit that little spell like everybody does during the course of the year, but to their credit, they picked it back up. Juan Arebe homered his last time up. Shortstop from the Dominican Republic. Well, our kind of got his feet tangled a little bit there, Mike. He mm -hmm. looked like he wanted to block the bag from Brzezinski being able to get to it. The throw was there, but he, he kind of tumbled in front of it, leaving the back corner open. Now, Kevin's had some interesting flops this year. He's one of our favorites. I mean, he's uh, always a brilliant. And try for the other base. Well, this is like a spring training game, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you are going to work on some as a catcher, you know, to with the lead like is uh, that Chicago has. That's just the old daylight play. You can see Graffinino throw his hand up. No sign other than the one the second baseman put on. Oh, you're right. Get your timing down. You may need it. Ugh. How about getting your breaking ball down? <laughs> that helps, too. <laughs> that helps. Well, what a job this kid has, has done the last couple of years. All he heard about Uribe was what he couldn't do in Colorado. Came over here. We, we've mentioned it with other players, but it, it's so true, Mikey. He, he's comfortable here. And uh, Joey Cora has helped him. I mean, having Ozzie Gein as your manager, being a young shortstop, that, that can't hurt anything. Gonzalez up the top. Well, and then as well, there's a certain amount of uh, a chemistry, for lack of a better word, in a lineup. And some guys are more scientific, take pitch type of hitters, and some guys are cut and slash guys, and you want those guys on with, ba with guys on base. Because you know the pitcher, the pressure's on him. He's got to throw strikes. He's going to be around the strike zone, and these guys are going to make contact. Try it again at second. Like you said, Mike, that, that pressure thing. When, when you hit a guy ninth offensively, there, there is no pressure. Yeah. You know, you're a free swinger. Go up there, you know, try to get the ball down, try to swing and a strike. But, man, you'll take 16 homers and 71 RBIs out of your ninth guy. That's pure gravy. <laughs> you're always, Icing. You're always <laughs> thinking of food, aren't you? Icing I don't know. Gravy. 
Lamb. Yeah. <laughs> you got me. You got me. All your rebates thinking about right now is swinging the bat, man. This is, uh, you hit a home run, your last at bat, you get that momentum going right now. And I think it's so important, like what Mike said, Boomer, to, for them not to change their approach right now. Still go up there, still put pressure on Boston. Yeah. Ripped in the hole, base hit. Rowan's going to be waved home by Joey Cora. Ramirez's throw, not in time. 9 to Chicago. You watch Uribe here hitting a couple of balls. Ball close to him. Down across the strike zone. Smoked in the hole. Ozzie again, too, before you talking about what a great year his third base coach, Joey Cora, has had. Keeping this young team aggressive, knowing who the base runner was there, rolling with great speed. He was going to test the arm of Manny Ramirez, even with all of the outfield assists for Manny this year. He scored easily. And you just love a former third base coach giving props to his third oh, base coach. There's a brethren there, every position, right? That is a, that's a position on the field. A lot of pressure uh, on your third base coach. Yep. Sending. Oh. Tell them in Boston. There's, there's more. I mean, and I'm sure there's everywhere. Here in Chicago, poor Wendell. Kim always. Wendell was also in Boston. Whoever the third base coach, they've been on Dale Swain. They've, they've been on you know, Wendell. Kim Renee Latchman always was good. You can never do the right thing if you're the third base coach. Oh, this might be right. Way back. Way back. Long ball again by Chicago. The Pachetnik adventure has set sail. Oh, boy. Pitching, defense, and three-run homers, and we have ourselves officially a blowout. Oh, man. Boomer, you mentioned another home run for Chicago, but the first home run of the year for Scott Putsednik. And down and in to a left-hand hitter is no man's land. He just dropped the head of the bat. To run like that and then go deep, it's not fair, Rick. <laughs> so Gucci it's not pops fair. out. Not fair. <laughs> wow. How about that? First homer of the year, and you do it in the postseason. And he was the guy that, of course, it ties an ALDS record. It hasn't been a long so far, uh, that long. 12 runs and four homers are White Sox postseason records. We told you they hadn't won a home postseason game since game one of the World Series in 1959. What was that? Partees at the beginning? Check. I mean, it's only one win, but that's that'll get that off the boards. But a long time ago, an early win beat the Dodgers in that World Series. Their last win of any sort in the postseason, Ozzie was the shortstop. It was in 93 when uh, they lost to Toronto 4-2. Came on the road, of course. You know, Mike, there's great stories in the game. You, you know, you, you were drafted in the 400th round or whatever it was to get to the big leagues. Amazing. How about Scott put said now? Nine years at the minor league level. Told that he couldn't hit. Told he'd never play in the big leagues. But one of my favorite words is, is persevere. And I mean, what a what a great case of, of him being able to do that and then to have that moment with this big crowd. And he was, of course, voted in as the extra player in the All-Star game this year. Besting Derek Jeter, a fan favorite, and that's the kind of guy you want in there. Die grounds out to end the inning, but long ball again, Chicago. Another four spot. If only the Bears could score like this. 12 to 2 White Sox. It is officially party on in Chicago. Summer-like temperatures. The White Sox haven't won a home playoff game since the late 50s. They're up 12 to 2 on the defending champion Red Sox. But I will say this. Bill Miller steps in against Jose Contreras and pops this up. And said, uh, rather, Przinski sheds it. That's just that. Boston with back not back completely to wall but backed up in a little trouble i think we've seen them respond to four. 
as lately as this weekend. It was lately as Thursday, that win they had against Toronto. Lately as this weekend against the Yankees. Sunday, we don't have to go back to last year. Everybody knows that situation. They wouldn't, I, you know, when they swept the Cardinals last year in the World Series, it was so un Boston. I mean, if they you can accomplish something, <laughs> you got to do it with action. Drama. Right? Drama. Now, there you heard what Terry said. I mean, he's. If the White Sox are going to score, they're saying, well, they might as well let them score them all now. Of course, there's no assurance that it'll stop. But. To me, though, Boomer, the, the big difference in Boston this year as opposed to last year, you, you, I just look at the divisional series a year ago. Kurt Schilling, a 21-game winner. Pedro, mm -hmm. and then Derek Lowe came up big for him in that sweep. I, their starting pitching is not near as good Correct. or as healthy as it was last year. Correct. How about the heroes welcome to Pitsednik, who they love here in Chicago? left field. Well, they know how important he has been to this ball club. They know what he has done on the base paths. We know about the stolen bases, but Mike, right along with that, you catching all those years would get a good look at. This is a great defensive outfield. Absolutely. Raffinino grounds out to Rebay. They cover a lot of turf out there. Nine straight outs by Contreras to add on to the 12 runs that they've piled on. This has been been a party for them. Well, I love what he's doing here now, though. I mean, he's, he's making it fun for them offensively, Mike, because uh, he's he's out there, he's throwing strikes, they're catching the ball, and the next thing you know, they're hitting again. Exactly. Get him, get us back in the dugout. Get us back hitting. Throw strikes. There's a catcher, you just keep firing that one down there? Uh, whatever's <laughs> working, exactly. Oh, when you get a team hot offensively and they're swinging the bats like Chicago is today, you want to just keep them hitting. What I was saying, too, what you were saying, Rick, about Pesednik, I mean, somewhere along the line, I think he probably lists someone. He asked for advice. He listened to someone. I mean, it, it, there's always people in your career that make an impact upon you. And I'm curious to know is if someone got him and said, hey, look, you got to get on base by walk or by hit. Contreras just mowing him down. One, two, three for the third straight inning. Damon gone. Seventh inning stretch time here. 12-2 here at the bottom of the seventh. Aaron Andrews down below. Aaron? Thanks, Boomer. Well, Paul Canerco, one of the guys who went yard today for the Chicago White Sox. Ozzy Guillen telling me when he first came to this team, there were so many negative things that he heard about Paul Canerco. But then he showed up. He got to know him. He said he came in day in and day out, and he proved himself to be the complete opposite. He's known as the sole guy in this locker room, Mr. White Sox, if you will. He's one of the guys that have been here the longest. Boomer? He's certainly celebrating today, Aaron. He almost homered in the first. He homered in his next at bat in the third inning. He's made a couple of nice scoops over there at first. And in a 12-2 game, ah, there you go. He, he nubbed it out. But here it was in the third inning. Off of Matt Clement. And breaking ball broke over the left field stands. I tell you, Boomer, I thought a great moment on Sunday was everyone in that White Sox clubhouse before the final game of the year, all they cared about was him picking up one more RBI to get to 100. It was a great moment. There was a runner on third. Jermaine Dye was up. Nobody. And Mike, Jermaine Dye did not want to swing the bat. I mean, he, he just did not want to swing it. He, he wanted to make an out. He wanted to walk or whatever. He set up the opportunity. Canerco got the hit. They, they bowed to each other. It was just a... To me, it was a great nice. team moment. And that does, that builds that winning attitude. It builds that, uh, just that, that we, that, yeah, that we attitude, that we attitude, that we're all pulling on the same side of the road. Ozzy telling all of us before the game, too, Boomer, he said, you know, what would you rather have? Two guys that hit 50 homers. I think he was kind of talking about Manny and Ortiz. Or would you rather have five guys that hit 20? Mm -hmm which is what he has. He says with the five guys hitting 20, you have more opportunities to score. And you know what? That's that's what they've done today. And you'd like to believe that uh, everybody's not going to go cold at once unless you run into an extremely hot pitcher. And that's when you have the speed of, yep. you know, Pesednik to try to, to balance it out. A lot of answers. Well, to Boston... Last time they gave up a double digit as Carl Everett uh, pops it. 
Raffinino there. This time uh, they give up a double-digit effort on the scoreboard in the postseason. It was game three to the end. He's 19 runs to win the next eight games. But they're down 12-2 today. Fans, join Major League Baseball in our efforts to rebuild the Gulf Coast. Support Habitat for Humanity by calling 1-800-HABITAT. Logging on to MLB.com or Habitat.org. And uh, certainly both Katrina and Rita. Not, you don't even know where to begin. The pictures don't do it justice. We know it's been time since, but that aid is going to be needed for a long, long time. Someone that, that certainly felt very close to it. You know, Kevin Millar is from Beaumont, Texas. That's where Rita hit the second one. He's filling me up with him. was okay, but uh, lots of folks down there not as fortunate. So our, our best wishes to everyone down. And, and that rebuilding and restructuring lives will go on for a long time. You don't ever, even if you can't rush in now to help, that help can come six, eight, ten months from now. It'll be just as much needed. Keep them on your mind. There's a lot of great people doing a lot of good things. One thing we know, Boomer, you mentioned it earlier in the game, this, this series is far from over. Oh, yeah. This, yeah. this is one game, and regardless of what happens tomorrow night, when it gets back to Boston, it'll be every bit as loud as it is right now, and it'll be a great series. Hulk, you shot off the mound, and uh, Graffinito makes the play on Rowan. Hey! 1-2-3 inning by Red Sox pitching. 12-2, to two, the White Sox lead the defending world champion Boston Red Sox here in the top of the eighth inning. Jose Contreras has been nothing short of brilliant. And you know his story. Highly bid on between the Red Sox and Yankees after the 2002 season when he defected on October 25th, 2002. Defected from Cuba, pitching for the Cuban national team during the America series in Mexico. Then bidding war, then the Yankees that... He never quite as such, you pointed out earlier as he works at Guerrero, you know, from Cuba to New York. You talk about a, a, a culture change. It never quite showed what he did in seven years as a pitcher for the Cuban national team when he was 117 and 50. Then came the trade on the last day before the trading deadline a year ago, July 31st. Ken Williams getting him from the Yankees for Esteban Loaiza, who had some success with New York a little, and they were hoping that the change of. Uh, Change of geography is die makes a catch on Renteria. Man, they got it all working. They've had that defense working all year, Boomer. We talked about it earlier, Mike, the speed in that outfield. Uh, what difference does it make if you hit a double or if you take a double away from the opposition? Jermaine Dye with the ability to do both. It's a great jump on that ball. Look at the concentration. Looking at the glove, the ball into the glove. Especially 12-2, you can afford to be aggressive. Mm -hmm. You can afford to take chances, and it's just going to continue to give your team momentum. You know, for a big guy, when healthy as he is, this year, he's pretty good outfield. A lot of assists. He's, he's, he's a pretty, pretty good player. Graceful for a big guy yep. as well. You now they get the big shift on Big Poppy again. Kind of a, excuse me, base hit to off the shift to the left side of the infield, and now he goes to the left side. Oh, but that one is not grabbed by Pudsednik. <laughs> and Big Pappy kind of got tangled up in blue. And then gets in there at a second. I, he thought that Pudsednik was going to catch it. Catch. He made a right-hand turn to the dugout toward the coach's box and went, whoa, Nelly, the ball's rolling to the wall. You, you can't give it an error. I mean, it, it's an obvious ball that Mike could have been caught, but to you me... You just said it, right? Be aggressive now, right? He, yeah. But he got kind of got caught in between. I don't think he knew what... I think he, to begin with, he wanted to dive, and then he realized, wait, I don't have to dive, and then he just simply missed it. It's all right. We got to say it. That was a Pitsednik adventure. <laughs> yeah, Big Poppy was confused. He was yeah. listening to Maureen McGovern <laughs> sing the morning after. <laughs> It's 12, hey, I it's 12 to 2. I open you're gonna, the garage. You're going to laugh back, a lot. I open the you. garage and back out the cars, okay? Man. I was like, where are you going? That's a knock. Manny Ramirez. To finish the story on Contreras, which is well known, the trade comes at the, just uh, July 31st in 04. 
was okay. Five and four last year with the White Sox. Gets up to a pretty good start this year. We've documented the way he has pitched. He has his buddy from Cuba, El Duque, along, which certainly yeah. helps. Right? They were together in New York as Manny Ramirez will foul this out of play. And today he's got his family in the crowd. He's yeah. uh, got his wife Miriam with her. Nayleen and Lennis are in the crowd as well. Uh, what an exciting day for them. And you talk about, you know, we think we've had a bad day or tough months. or They don't know when they're going to see him. The defect yeah. in Mexico. That, that's And as you said, with El Duque's presence on the team as well, it's just got to, you both have the same story, the same struggle, mm -hmm. the same sort of desire to come to the United States and play Major League Baseball. So it just makes the, uh, the atmosphere just more comfortable, feel more at home. You know, and Mike, right along with that, to, you know, to not even be able to communicate with your wife and yeah, kids, I, I can't imagine. No, I no. can't. The stress. Manny here, as we've seen, I mean, just... Three ground ball outs yeah, thus he's far. A, he's been aggressive. He's tried to take a few pitches. He's in the hole here. Talked about Contreras being comfortable. Manny is not. Well, he came in red hot. But Rebe with a rocket, and Manny is grounded out of the infield four times today. Two down, big copy over to third base. Sports Center coming up next. Dan Patrick, more from here in Chicago. The Cardinals had it 8-0. We saw La Russa make pitching changes late. And what are you doing? It was 8-5. Go ahead, run came to the plate. Should you bench your fantasy team? Well, this is a fantasy for White Sox fans. And look at the standing ovation for Jose Contreras, family and all. He's pitched brilliantly, and he leaves with a 12 2. Wow. Thank you, Ravi. That's uh, been the shining light for the Padres. He's, this man was a shining light and then some for the Chicago White Sox. Jose Contreras gone, and now a name that you may not know. He may not know a lot of these White Sox, but this young man, Neil Cox, the lefty out of the bullpen, has put together quite a resume this year. 4 0. ERA of an opponent batting average under 180. He's great against the first batter that he faces, which is, even though at 12 2, here's a two out runner at third, gets the first guy out almost all the time. That's a young man that grew up, I'm sure, so, in the Chicago area, Belleville, Illinois. A thrill for him to pitch here in the postseason. Some kind of bullpen for Ozzy again. Two left handers, three right handers. I mean, that's an easy 92 right there, Michael. Easy cheese. I'm always thinking of food, right? <laughs> I know what RBIs are called, steaks. <laughs> Trot Nixon. That's a can, to left. A can, can of corn. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a smorgasbord for the White Sox. 12 to 2. To present their fans with what looks like their first home postseason win since 1959. Lead the Red Sox 12 to 2. And here's the hitting star. Well, there were many, but A.J. Pruszynski's three run homer in the first inning took it from 2 0 to 5 0. Lots of changes. Boston. Bronson Arroyo is now in the pitch. Now you say, well, gee, it's 12 2. Arroyo, a starter, now in the bullpen. Why would you do it? We'll talk about that in a minute. Simple answer. Alex Cora is the shortstop. The new third baseman is going to be Kevin Euclid. Adam Heisdu is the center fielder. So you might as well get everybody in. They get him in, say they played in the postseason. They're on the roster. And Persinski down the line and right back. back going again. For Pruszynski, he caught Contreras, and twice he's gone yard. There's that ball drifting back to the inside part of the strike zone. AJ, a nice fluid swing right there. Really isn't 
laboring with those swings. I mean, just. And they want the curtain call, and they got it from their catcher, A.J. Przinski. We uh, misspoke. Euclid not in at third. Bill Miller stays in, but High's doing Cora and Arroyo are in. A couple of notes. Isn't it interesting how it works this way? They haven't won a, uh, a home playoff game since 1959. Do you know that that's the only other time a White Sox has hit two home runs in a postseason game? Ted Klazuski oh, in game yeah. one. They've known him as a red, but clue. Klazuski, Przinski. I, I think there's a theme there. The Lumpkies for everybody. <laughs> the Cabasa connection. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm sorry, Rick. I just... Uh, <laughs> I'm a good man. So 13 to 2. Bronson Arroyo started Wednesday and didn't pitch well in a game Boston lost to Toronto. 7 2 pitch, one inning, and the big win over the Yankees Sunday. Terry Francona telling us look, he can go every day. He can go all five games. And I'm kind of surprised. In some ways he's pitching, but maybe, hey, stay loose. Brzezinski's loose, we know that. But I mean, don't forget, too, about Boston. I mean, a lot of intense games down the stretch. That last big series yes. with the Yankees. I mean, that's what uh, Terry's doing here. I mean, put the guys in, put put the uh, put the B team in right now. Give some uh, give some rest to these guys. You know what? We'll try it again tomorrow. Sun will come up tomorrow. There Sleep in. It's a six o'clock local game, and as we said, Yankees got 19 in Game Three of the ALCS. Yeah. Boston won eight postseason games after that. Absolutely. Don't forget, this is a team that came back down 3-0 to the to the New York Yankees, and they came back twice against Mariano Rivera. So they they have something left in the tank. I mean, we know they're not going to roll over and die. But we know that. The only thing is, in a short series, you have a little bit more of a sense of urgency. You can't. Being down two nothing in the short series is different than a seven. Although they've done series. that yeah. against Oakland a couple of years ago, losing two out west, coming back, winning two at home. Trot Nixon, Homer won it late. They went back out. Derek Lowe, remember, ended up uh, sure. finishing it at Oakland. So they've come down from 0-2 even. They've seen it all in Boston. There, there's not well, there's, there's white knuckles abound in New England. That's for sure. And there's Nixon with the Homer Millar. He, Certainly no stranger to, but there's a guy that in the clutch, so it's 12, 13, 2. Who would he need a, a big home run? There's a strike out there. Uribe is gone. Our Chevy player of the game. I know Krasinski has two home runs, but Jose Contreras, who has not lost since August 15th, in recognition of his outstanding play, today's Chevrolet player of the game, Jose Contreras. Chevrolet makes a $1,000 contribution to the Boys and Girls Club of America. Another thing accomplished by the White Sox this afternoon, Manny Ramirez had a 17-game postseason hitting streak. Unless he comes up again, which doesn't look like he will, that goes by the board. And that includes all 14 postseason games a year ago for Manny in Boston. Came in red hot. I mean, he was red hot the last two weeks. Well, that's why I agree with Contreras being the player of the game. Krasinski yeah. with a big night. But you could take all of Krasinski's numbers away, and the job that Contreras did still would have won the ball game. And you shut down a hitter like Manny. I mean, the pitches that he was making. And Manny did not want to uh, run deep counts. I mean, he was aggressive early. He was like, hey, I'm going to try and try and ambush him, as we say. Hit him early, not getting deep counts, because you know that the type of stuff that he had. And a guy like Johnny Damon, along with shutting down Manny, Johnny Damon's not gotten the ball out of the infield yet today. Oh, boy, you know what? There's an interesting story here out there at shortstop now is Alex Cora for the Red Sox. So he's there, younger brother of third base coach Joey Albacora. Mom Iris, I'm sure, watching, go, hey, who do I pick in this? So they... And he said, and Alex was with Cleveland earlier since when well, he always seems to battling the White Sox. My older brother there. Now, what do you do there? Well, you had the blood and the mud earlier. What, <laughs> what, you go with the oldest, youngest? Man, you got me on that one. Threw me a curve. Well, I'll tell you what, they're going to have to go some to top a brother's. Yeah. Say, I was at a hockey game when Keith Primo of the Whalers fought Wayne Primo of the, of the Sabres. And they both called their mother immediately after the game to apologize. <laughs> 
You know, another situation, the first one in, in the history of baseball, home plate umpire John Hirschbeck, his brother Mark. They were the first brother combination to be umpires in the big leagues at the same time. Connecticut boys. Is that right? Yeah. Oh, God, yes. We have lots of umpires in Connecticut. I have Sonia who's working today. Hirschbeck behind the plate. Bill Miller at first. Mark Wagner at second. Mark Carlson at third. Mike Everett at left. Dan I have Sonia in Connecticut. We got two Connecticut owners here. Tell you what, you, you got to give up. Tater was it? Steve Palermo. I mean, we had Rapuano. We got a lot of owners. Palermo? Yeah, yeah. He, yes. I know he's Kansas City, but he's been married in Connecticut for a long time. Take credit for him. Because he's our buddy. Now the adventure continues with the Red Sox. But Sednick walks. And now uh, who's left on the bench presented by ING for Boston? Will they get in? Uh, John Olerud going to start tomorrow against Mark Burley. And Kevin Euclid uh, just back had the... Uh, the ring finger is bandaged up to figure why play maybe, I don't know, until they absolutely need to. Doug Mirabelli will catch Wakefield in game three. And then Machado hasn't gotten in yet. But uh, talking to them all. Euclid's boomer on Friday night. It still bothers him to throw a little bit, but yep. he said absolutely no problem swinging the bat. Here off the bench is Willie Harris, a speedster, infielder, batting for a boot. Perez, your old teammate, Mike. Yeah, Timo Lito. I think he reached base. How many straight times he, in the he 2000 was, He was great. Playoffs, yeah. So what do you want to do next year? I hate to come out of left field with it, but <laughs> speaking of the Mets. Wow. Are you, you know what? We'll, we'll, give you, we'll give you a batter to talk about it. I mean, what a great send-off, first of all. It was Sunday amazing. Mets it was amazing. I, I really was overwhelmed, and the fan support was just incredible. You expect that? I mean, you knew there was fan appreciation day, but it turned out yeah. to be Mike Piazza appreciation day for the eight years you put it. Well, and it, again, it was a little awkward because, again, with the uncertainty in the game and player movement, and I don't know what direction the team's going to go in, and we haven't really begun to, 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 to discuss the future, but no matter what happens... I'll tell you what's going to happen. How about it? There you go. Two touchdowns and two extra points here for the Bears. 14 to Chicago. But back, back to your situation. Yeah, but, but no matter what happens, I mean, it was just an amazing day. And uh, we'll all, I'll always be, you know, in a great place with the Mets, no matter what happens. And I'm in a little bit in a quandary because I don't want to put pressure on them. I do want to come back in some ways, but I know in some ways it may not be the best for me or for the team. So, you know, we'll talk about it. I'll just just play it by ear. But in the meantime, just enjoy the moment for what it is. Boomer, you and I, we, we know what it was like in New York before he got there. Mm -hmm. um, wow. Gave no. that team a big-time identity. You know that. You don't need us to well, tell you. Uh, it was all because of the fans. I mean, they they got the best out of me I, as far as they made me better and made me concentrate. I know it was a lot of pressure to play there, but it was something I'll never, ever regret Having, or trade in. Mike, big crowds like that. Uh, you know, it, 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 it's so tough to, to motivate yourself all the time. That it, it has to help you, particularly with, you know, the, the grueling position that you, you played. Yeah, and, you know, again, like New York, Boston, and even Chicago to some extent. I mean, that's when you have that media pressure here, you have that fan pressure it, it 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 can do one of two things it can make you better or it can yeah. and make you worse so Scare you. it is a tough uh, a tough town these are three tough towns coming on Adam Heis do in center field and uh, Perez is going to now Jeff Plum how about Thursday who is that <laughs> cookie I got a cookie there and uh, fortunately didn't miss it. That was uh, a few kicks left. What can I say? I mean, people taking pictures. It just it just gained a life of its own. I was like very, you know, and it is just a little bit uncomfortable because I still feel like I have a few things I want to do in it as a player. And, you know, your friend, I mean, our friend Eric Carroll's told me, he said, if you're not a thousand percent sure, you know, that, that you want to turn the page, then you should give it another shot. And that's what I think I'm going to do. Wow, well, you would you, you 
certainly would do well. It's not like you're not going to hit homers and play well. And Jeff Blum pops it up. We're back with Mike and Rick and Aaron and the White Sox party. It has been a cotton candy. Time of the ninth here in Chicago on a summer day, and it was a day at the beach for the White Sox. 14 to 2. Contreras, brilliant. Two homers, Brzezinski. Home run, Conurco. Home run, Fitzsednik. Home run, Uribe. I think you get the picture. Cliff Polite has come in. Another one of that outstanding, remember that outstanding White Sox bullpen, the veteran Polite. Yeah, 181. Huh? Everybody comes in with, with the batting average under 200. Polite is there. Willie Harris is at second. Jeff Blum is at first. Timo Perez is in right. When you look at the numbers, Boomer, for the bullpens, you can see why the White Sox were so good in one run ball game. Even on the road, you, you bring in guys, they're going to get three outs, and you got an opportunity to win. Jason Veritek hits it up high for that Timo Perez over there, and there'll be one down. Look, there's 24 hours to the next game. It's going to start right now uh, tomorrow at uh, 6 central 7 eastern on espn we'll be here to see david wells and mark burley uh, momentum as good as tomorrow's starter either boston 14-2 what do you do do you say it doesn't happen yeah i think you just you know throw this game right out say hey we ran into a hot pitcher we ran into a hot uh, deep offense and we have to uh you know, obviously bounce back all right now you're chicago who has now ended the season by winning five, and now this would be six. Well, given the uh, record of Red Sox at home, I think that they feel like that they'd love to go in there up to an L. I, I totally agree with that. I think, it, again, as today was, Boomer, I think it's a must win for Chicago tomorrow. You let Boston win this game, that momentum gets going. They get back home, they get their crowd. It might not get back to Chicago. John Olerud batting for Millar, and Olerud give him a hack before tomorrow's game, right? Sweet Another former swinging, teammate of yours. Sweet swinging Johnny O. Oh, but he's just always talking. He never shuts up. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Talk so about a guy who could take pitches. This guy, he makes it look so easy, oh, too. Every, everything he does. He hit like 381 years. Yeah, 363, 363 won the batting title. Yep. Then they oh, wanted him to hit for more power, remember? Oh, man. How about what he did to your overall team defense when, when he got to the middle? Well, he's done it everywhere he's ever been. Without a doubt, one of the best defensive infields I've ever played with. I mean, you're talking about Johnny Oliver, Ray Ordonez, Edgardo Alfonso, and Robin Ventura. And, uh, you take it for granted. There weren't a lot of errors on that infield. Hit 354 or something for the Mets one year, didn't he? Hits this one pretty well. Back it goes, back at the wall. And it bounds away from Rowan, who hits the wall hard, and we got to check him. Oh, man, in a 14-2 game, he knows only one way to play it. He just hope he's not hurt on that. But then again, isn't that the White Sox? It's 14-2, but darn it, I'm going to go get it. He was at full stride, too, when he went out. <laughs> when he hit that wall, <laughs> did not break stride. Little, ooh. He almost hurt Louis Aparicio out there. Ooh. And face action there, unfortunately, but... Uh, He's in there, as you said, Chris. I mean, it's all they know. Yeah. I mean, you can't at this time. You can't expect him to pull up. I mean, it's just the way he's going to go after the ball. Bill Miller in. Miller off for three. Elite there. I faced him with the Phillies, and uh, as we were talking earlier, I mean, he's always had great stuff. Comes across his body a little bit, a little sinker, a little slurve, a little slider. Got to be hard on a right hand. It is. It's just a game goal. Any heavy ball, I mean, it's like trying to hit pool balls. Miller pops it. Willie Harris now in at second base, and Boston's out of their last down. Boy, it has been complete here at Chicago. David Wells will have a chance to change things around, and so will Big Poppy and Manny Ramirez and the Reds to the Red Sox thumpers. But the White Sox, if they look, they don't look like a team that had a 15-game lead that uh, they whittled away to game and a half, at least on one outing. They look awful confident. They feel awful good, and you got to be confident when you got Contreras on the mound. Boom, that nine straight starts that he has won pitching for this team. 
Tony Graffinito, the one-time right sock, and he sends it in the air to left. Back it goes, back to the wall. <laughs> and isn't that fitting? The home run snatched by Pichetnik. Mike Piazza enjoyed it. Yes. Rick Sutcliffe, great Pleasure. job. Always good. Aaron Andrews, thank you. The Chicago White Sox. Two touchdowns over the Red Sox with it 14 to 2. We will see you tomorrow, right around this time at 7 Eastern, 6 Central. Coming up next is Sports Center. This has been a presentation of ESPN, the worldwide leader in sports. So for all of our Division Series crew here in Chicago, I'm Chris Berman. Thanks for watching. 14 to the Palos. Defending champs in Chicago opening up their playoffs against the White Sox as seen on ESPN and A.J. Perzinski. Off Matt Clement, bottom of the first, setting the tone for this one as the White Sox rough up Matt Clement and the Red Sox go on to win it in comfortable fashion as they open up the uh, best of five series at home and they do so in impressive fashion. Welcome to Sports Center. We're here till 8:15 Eastern and we'll bring you highlights of the Cardinals and Padres coming up. We'll set the stage also for what's going on with the Yankees and Angels. Their game coming up in about an hour from now. Let's go out to uh, Chris Berman anchoring our coverage, calling the game with Rick Sutcliffe and Mike Piazza following a pretty impressive performance batting practice for the White Sox boomer. Zinski had two home runs, and they, Mike, you said it in the beginning. You said, you know, maybe what they found right at the end, that they got hot again at the right time, certainly looked like it today. Yeah, there's no question they came into this series with some momentum, and they had all cylinders firing today, both on the mound and uh, at the plate. And I love the fact, you know, we, you know, we always talk about a manager only manages when he has to. There were two spots for Ozzie Guillen today. In the first inning, Klaxednik at first, nobody out. He put on the sacrifice bunt. It led to a big beginning. The other spot was in the top of the fourth. A couple of runs Contreras had given up. He goes to the mound real quick. He says, forget about the runners. Stay aggressive. He gets the win. Now they got a big win, 14 to 2. Let's go down to Aaron Andrews. Aaron? A big win, certainly, and a big day for A.J. Persinski. A.J., you guys jump on Matt Clement so early. What was your approach offensively? Try to get strikes off of him. He can be uh, a little bit wild, a little bit all over the place. He hit a couple guys. Uh, getting on in the first inning, and Gucci getting him over, him getting on third for Pauly, and then uh, things just kind of took off from there. If he gets on base, we like our chance of getting him in. Mike Piazza said during our broadcast, you are so locked in right now. What is behind that? Well, it's been a long time since I hit a home run, so... Uh, well, two of them. I know. Forget one, but two. It's, uh, I don't know. It's just one of those things I got good pitches to hit, and I hit them. Uh, I've been missing them a lot lately. It's been frustrating, but, uh, you know, it's special. The playoffs, you get to start over and uh, forget what you did in the past. What an outing today by strikeouts. Uh, the first inning was huge. He got through Ortiz and Manny the first time. It gave him confidence. He took off from there. I mean, he was throwing 95-96 with a nasty split. He's as tough as they can be. Your first home win in the postseason since the 50s. You were kind of the ringleader with this whole chip on our shoulder attitude. Who's the underdog now, AJ? We still are. They're still Why? champions. They're still the, the defending champs. Heck, they came back from 3-0. No team's ever done that. So this win means, yeah, it's great. We won one, but we got two more to go. And uh, they're not going to roll over tomorrow. They're going to come out and they're going to be ready. And uh, it's going to be fun. We'll see you tomorrow. Thanks right. so much. Thanks, Aaron. All right, guys. Aaron, thank you very much. Well, guy, I mean, tomorrow, let's look ahead. Wells, Burley, uh, different sort of game. You can never tell what sort of game you're going to have, but Wells knows now they need a sharp outing. you got to feel like it's going to be a quick game. Both of those yes. guys throw a lot of strikes. They like to put their defense into play. I think it's really going to be a lot on the managers tomorrow, Mike. You're, you're going to see some hit and run, and you're going to see them trying to manufacture some runs. Yeah, obviously with Boston, I mean, they do want to get a better effort on the mound and, and shut down that uh, offense, the Chicago offense, and keep those, keep a segment, Sednick off the bases and, and give their team a chance to hit their, hit their way back into the series. There's not much in the speech department that's necessary, right? I mean, it's baseball. It's not <laughs> Absolutely. Right? Keep it simple. Keep it very simple. The Red Sox, we know they can hit it, but it was the White Sox all over today with the five home runs, a couple of three-run homers, diving catches when they're up by 10 or 12 runs, uh, running into the wall with a 12 with a 12-run lead. Uh, I guess they know only one way to play, and Ozzie Guillen, well, 
He was on the team that last won a postseason game for the White Sox in 93. Now he's managed them to one. Dan, should be fun here tomorrow. And by the way, you know Chicago. I'm going to take a guess. Summer-like temperatures. Going to be fun here tonight. Thank you, Boomer. <laughs> Today's loss to the White Sox just the third time in their 122 postseason game history. The Red Sox lost by double digits, fortunately for Boston fans, of their three previous biggest postseason losses. They have gone on to win the next game in the series each time.